Okay, thank you, Cindy. Um, welcome everyone to the March 3rd, 2022 plan City of Boulder Planning Board meeting. Uh, we do have a quorum. Uh, we have uh, six of the seven members here and we're expecting um, our seventh member to join us at any moment. Uh, so we'll go ahead and call this meeting to order. Uh, before we proceed, um, I'll hand it over to Jean Gatza, uh, who will be telling us about the uh, procedures for virtual meeting participation. Jean? I'm actually going to try my hand at it this time. Oh, you're going to do it? Okay, thank you. Cindy. I'm going to give it a shot. So I'm going to share my screen. Okay. Um, welcome everyone to planning board. We're also glad that you have joined us this evening. We're aiming to keep these meetings respectful and orderly. As such, we have some specific protocol for the meeting. The city has engaged with community members to co-create a vision for productive, meaningful, and inclusive civic, civic conversations. This vision supports physical and emotional safety for community members, staff, and council, as well as democracy for people of all ages, identities, lived experiences, and political perspectives. More about this vision and the, and the full rules can be found on our uh, website, found on the Participate in City Council Meetings page. The following are examples of rules of decorum found in the Boulder Revised Code and other guidelines that support this vision. These will be upheld during our meeting. All remarks and testimony shall be limited to matters related to city business. No participant shall make threats or use other forms of intimidation against any person. Obscenity, dehumanizing language, racial epitaphs, and other speech and behavior that disrupts or otherwise impedes the ability to conduct the meeting are prohibited. Participants are required to sign up to speak using the name they are commonly known by, and individuals must display their whole name before being allowed to speak online. And currently, only audio testimony is permitted online. When we do, um, let's see, bear with me, I'm so sorry. All content related comments or questions in the Q&A will be promptly deleted. Um, the Q&A is used for the public, um, not the chat. And so that is what you will use. And please keep in mind that that is for only technical questions. Any um, content related comments or questions are going to be deleted and not addressed. Um, if there are repeated comments or questions in the Q&A that are disrupting my ability to do my job moderating the, the meeting, I will notify the board chair to issue a warning. And if it continues, suggest that, these, that those offending the rule be removed from the meeting. And we thank you for understanding that these rules are to be kept meetings orderly and fair. And I'm gonna turn it back over to you, Mr. Chair. Okay, thank you very much, Cindy. Um, so um, I guess we'll go ahead and continue to go forward uh, since we've started the meeting and uh, we'll go now into our uh, public participation section. Uh, this is uh, general public participation where the public is welcome to talk to us about anything that's on your minds. Uh, you have three minutes maximum per speaker. Uh, you please do refrain from speaking about uh, items on our public hearings. We will have a special uh, public participation uh, public for the public hearing. And the only one we have uh, tonight is a proposal for student housing at 2900 East College Avenue. So if you want to speak to us about college, the 2900 East College Avenue project, please wait uh, until that comes up probably in about an hour and 20 minutes. Uh, so otherwise, ever, anyone who would like to speak uh, about anything else, please start raising your hands now. And uh, I will have uh, Cindy and, and or Jean help me with unmuting. Uh, if I see hands go up. So far, so, I don't, so don't see anything. Oh, I see a hand coming up. Uh, yes. Great. Okay. So uh, we have uh, Harmon Zuckerman. Harmon, you should be able to unmute. Oh, I'm sorry. One moment. I do need to unmute him. My mistake. Welcome back, Harmon. <laughs> well, I just wanted to say hi to all of you guys. Um, I teach a class at, uh, hi guys, I, I teach a class called Governing for Sustainable Communities at CU in the master's program and in, in environment. And uh, some of my students are, are 
here um, seeing a public hearing. I know this is probably a really short and uh, a hopefully non-controversial agenda tonight, but um, I was also kind of hoping it would be really long and controversial so they would get a taste of what we do. Um, but anyway, I didn't want to just lurk here without saying hello. So uh, thank you guys for uh, doing everything you do and it's great to see your faces again. Thanks, Harmon. And for those uh, who may not know, Harmon uh, was is an alumnus of the uh, planning board who uh, left left uh, after his five year term last year at this time, and uh, served as chair the last year. And uh, we miss him. So thanks for saying hi. Uh, anyone else uh, wish to speak to planning board? I see Georgie has arrived. Um, if, if you can promote Georgie. I'll, I'll break protocol and just say that um, our meetings are recorded. So if you'd like to assign your students some very long controversial meetings, that is always an option. <laughs> Apologies to the students. Maybe, maybe he can do like little specific pieces. Indeed. All right. Well, um, I don't see any more hands going up from the public. So thank you, uh, Harmon, for that. Um, oh, wait, um, we do have a hand. Um, we, Lynn, Lynn um, you can should be able to unmute. Yeah, I thought Georgie was coming on to speak. Yeah, it's a blur after a while. I was trying to juggle between EAB and LB last night and testify at both, which was impossible, even though the Landmarks Board changed their agenda on my behalf. The EAB is like the Gestapo. The, you're muted. There's no video, the chat is disabled. And the only thing I could do was write where you put your name and take messages there, you know, rename myself. And they didn't like that either. They said, you have to have your name there. So I couldn't even say, look, I'm trying to testify at two places at once. What do you want? I'm doing the best I can. I can't clone myself, you know? And, and, and that reminds me, please, please don't conflict with, um, OSBT, because it, the OSBT is the most important one. Do not conflict with that night. That's too important because of CU South coming up and, um, and RAB and, um, and Landmarks and EAB. And you know, EAB was 46 minutes long. <gasps> Unbelievable. And they couldn't hear one person speaking for two minutes. You know, come on really let's get real here and then landmarks board went until 9 35 9 36 you know like what is this our environmental advisory board like it's so disconnected like they should be the longest board they should be longer than planning board because it's all about our environment and you know now that we got this war okay how do you want you guys want to die do you want to die for climate of climate change, or do you want to die from war? Well, my vote is climate change. I would much rather die of climate change. And you know, we can do all this building and all this planning and everything. And you know, we can be vaporized in an instant. And I hope it goes that fast. You know, this was all our country that did this coup in Ukraine. It's all Victoria Newland, N-U-L-A-N-D, the um, phone call that was intercepted. Read it. You need to understand your country and what your country is capable of. And it is damned scary. And, you know, the wealth disparity that's happening in Boulder, it trickles up, it trickles down, and it comes back at us in the blood of the Ukrainians. That's how it manifests. We are the cause of that. It is not Vladimir Putin. It is Joe Biden. Joe Biden's right in the middle of it. For years, 2004 election, 2014 election in Ukraine, it's all set up. Okay, so in Boulder, we got to slow down on the wealth inequity. Slow down fast. Bye. Thank you, Lynn. Okay. And uh, last call then for hands for the general open comment period. All right, well, thank you. 
Um, we'll go ahead and close open comment and we'll have another open comment for our uh, uh, public hearing later. Uh, so with that, um, we'll move on to agenda item three, which is uh, the, um, dispositions, call-ups and continuations. We have a single call-up item. Uh, this one expires, I think a week from today. Uh, use review for an indoor recreational or athletic facility use at 3640 Walnut Street, suites B and C, Shredder Indoor Ski and Snowboard School, that's LUR 2022-00001. Uh, so um, the information is in our packet. Uh, let me see who might be here to answer questions. I'll be covering for Elaine tonight, Mr. Great. Excellent, thank you, Charles. Uh, so if there are any questions or any desire to call this up, please signify. Okay, I don't see any uh, any concerns or questions. So with uh, we will uh, not be calling that up tonight. Uh, so uh, with that, then we'll move on to uh, number four, which is matters. So usually we put matters at the end of the meeting, uh, but uh, tonight, uh, in, out of respect for our visiting speakers, thank you for attending. Uh, where we moved uh, one section of matters up, and uh, the matters will be related to fire and building regulations. Uh, this is, I understand, mostly a Q and A kind of format. Um, and uh, we have, I see here, Dave Lowry, who's battalion chief for the Boulder Fire Fire Department. We have uh, Brian o Oliver, who's the Wildland Battalion Chief, and you can correct me if I get any of your titles wrong, and then uh, Will Birchfield, who's chief building official for the city. So um, we so much are looking forward to hearing from you. And um, actually, Lisa Smith was uh, kind enough to kind of uh, come up with the idea of, of inviting you all. So Lisa, if you want to say a few words, and then we'll hand it over to our guests and uh, open it up for however you want to do the Q&A. Um, yes, as, as David just said, it's it's my fault that you're here. And so thank you so much for giving up your time tonight. Um, so what I was hoping um, for was maybe without, because we have a, a certain amount of time and I want to be respectful of your time, um, uh, to kind of hear a bit about the places where fire code is really strong. Um, as somebody with a planning background who dug into this a little bit, but has nowhere near your expertise, um, my surface level understanding that I'd love to hear from you guys about is that um, for new builds or major remodels or even additions of a new features to homes, uh, specifically in the WUI, Wildland Urban Interface, um, that we have very robust code. Um, and, and perhaps you guys are also looking at, at modifying it or improving it further if, if needed. I don't know if that's even necessary. Um, so I, I'd love to get kind of a sense of the extent of the WUI um, and of how the code applies to new build. Um, but then without spending too much time on that, I, I want to read it into record and acknowledge all of the excellent work that's gone into that. Um, I'd also love to hear whether you're rethinking the extent of the WUI, um, and if so, kind of what things you're looking at for that or what might trigger that or why that'd be a good or a bad idea. Um, and then I'd also like to look back, I'm thinking back to, um, and Hella can correct me if I get this wrong or, or you can correct me, um, but back to when we, for example, retired cedar shingles as a, an option for roofing. Um, you know, and one of the things I wondered about is, when and if it would be time to say, hey, you know, next time your roof or your siding or whatever has reached the end of its natural life, you know, if, if you're in the WUI, um, and again, this is from a planning perspective, um, from a fire perspective, you know, do you think it'd be appropriate to say, you, you know, you're gonna need to put a class A material on that, you know, something that's gonna take two to four hours to burn. Um, and then I'll stop talking shortly, um, but I just wanna acknowledge something that'll probably come up repeatedly through this discussion um, and should certainly go into the minutes. Um, and that is that we can't fireproof anything. Um, this is about mitigation. This is about making things a bit slower to burn. This is about creating defensible space and, and, and things of that nature. Um, you know, so we, we can't completely prevent things from burning, but there are things we can do. And, and I guess two other things I wanted to mention um, that I think can, may fall under, under code and planning purview or, or may be better housed elsewhere um, would be that defensible space um, you know, I live in multifamily uh, in Shanahan Ridge. I, I am in the WUI. I back down to Shanahan Ranch and I watch the fire start. Um, and if it had been to the West, we would have gone. Um, you know, and there are people, wonderful neighbors who have juniper 
planted, you know, on their patios <laughs> um, up against their houses. So, you know, I, I think that there's also some things that are maybe less expensive, less intensive that um, have to do with landscaping and, and, and just mitigation in that way. So hopefully that wasn't too all over the place and we're excited to hear from you guys. Thanks, Lisa. And uh, I'll just mention too that we're going to try to keep this discussion to wrap up at about 7.15, a um, little over, little, about an hour from now. Uh, so kind of gauge our pace on that. So um, with that, I'll hand it over. David, did you want to kick this off or who would like to do that? You guys want me to kick it off, Brian? Uh, I mean, yeah, if they're going to talk about codes, that's your, uh, that's your expertise, sir. Okay. Uh, Will, you okay with that too? Okay. Whew, that was a lot, Lisa. Um, so I like to pick the easy stuff out um, first. And so I'm going to jump back to our roofing ordinance um, and just say good news about that, right? Uh, the roofing ordinance was in 1994. Um, and part of that roofing ordinance was a 20 year replacement. Um, and so that ran up in 2014. So um, all of the roofs that we're aware of, and I think we're pretty good aware, in the city of Boulder uh, have class A roofs on them, right? That is roofing material. And keep in mind the building code, I think a lot of you guys already know this. So, um, you know, basically there's a definition for, you know, a roof before it becomes siding, right? Our roofing ordinance was only for roofs, not siding. So you can drive around town and you can see buildings that have wood shingles on their as siding, but that is not roofing material. And it, it you know, may, maybe not needs to be roofing because, you know, we're talking about the embers that fall on and stay on and not come off. So that, that, that is the distinction. So the good news is that in the city of Boulder, every home and every structure, right? It doesn't have to be a home, um, has a class A roof on them and they can only put class A's going forward. So we don't really need to be worrying about um, any like, hey, your end of life roof, that's already been taken care of. Now, um, the, the thing to keep in mind that if you're in some areas um, in on the edge of our community, and gun barrel always comes to the easiest one to look at is that, you know, you literally have a street where this side is the city and this side is the county. So you can be looking at houses literally in the street where this side has wood roofs on it and this side does not, right? And the irony is, and I don't know of a better way to say it except, you know, we got to draw, you know, the line was drawn someplace and we can't make the folks in the county replace their roofing because they're not under our jurisdiction. So um, trust me, I heard that a lot in um, 2014 is my neighbor across the street um, doesn't have to replace their wood roof. And I'm like, I know this, uh, there's a line down the middle of your street, basically. So the wood roofing is kind of easy. We've been moving forward to that. And that is a pretty good um, transition into our adopted codes, right? So um, keep in mind that we adopt uh, the international codes. I realize that I think most of y'all understand that. International Building Code, Mechanical Code, International Fire Code, and there is an International Urban Interface Wildland Code associated with that. We first adopted that code uh, in uh, in the let's say the 2012 cycle. So technically, we adopted that in 2013. Um, and we've held that code um, all the way, and we now have the 2018 adopted. And when we go to the next set of codes, whenever that may be. Uh, we will continue adopting that code. So when we talk about uh, building in the interface, it's really all about that um, uh, urban interface wildland code. And it kind of goes in with our, our uh, building code, the adopted uh, building code and adopted residential code um, as well. Um, so the, the transition with the housing is, is that, you know, one of the most important um, when we get into the actual building code requirements, um, one of the ignition resistant construction is class A roofs, right? And so just think we were 20 years ahead of, 
of this particular code when we adopted that. And, um, and the wood roof ordinance came out of, I don't wanna say fires, well, I can, I mean, fires that we saw in December, right? In other parts of our country that was recognized that the spread of those fires was coming from some of the building material, namely uh, wood roofs that were igniting those and causing, uh, contributing to that conflagration in those residential neighborhoods, right? So our leadership at that time, you know, could see that and then made that bold move on those wood roofing. So credit to those folks back in that day um, on it. Okay, so we have the, the, the wildland code adopted. Um, and within that wildland code, uh, it's not a big code is what I would tell you. It's actually a relatively small code. It's basically six chapters um, per se. Um, and the first few chapters are kind of like everything, right? I mean, it's the administration, the definitions. They got some general requirements, which covers uh, items like access and water supply, uh, street signage, stuff that if we were living in rural parts of our county or other like rural areas that um, that it's not that we take for granted, but it's like, oh yeah, we, we have streets, we have water supply, we mark our streets with street signs, which sounds silly, but some places don't, don't have that, right? And so the WUI code is trying to standardize that and say, you know what really helps wildland firefighters is to know where they're going and to have streets where they're going and to know not pass an unmarked area that they were supposed to turn on. Um, silly, kind of, um, because we take it all for granted um, because we already have that in the city. So now where this comes into play is chapter five in that. And chapter five is the building part of that. That's the chapter that really comes in and says, this is where we need, this is where it starts defining the ignition resistant construction that we want to put on in the buildings, the structures that we've identified in that interface zone, right? Um, and so that's kind of the key compart uh, uh, component. And I know that that was one of the questions that Lisa had asked is like, we have identified an interface, we've had it identified prior to even adopting um, this, uh, this particular code in 2013. Um, are we looking at modifying it? A short answer is yes. The longer answer, which is not very much longer, is we're always looking at modifying that, right? It's, it, it's we're not looking at modifying our interface per se because of the Marshall Fire. We are already like examining that. And we do that um, kind of continually. But if we were just following the letter of the code, it's every three years um, that that WUI code tells us to re-examine that and look in that. So we, we constantly are looking at it. We modify it ever so slightly. But back to chapter five and those building requirements, that's where we get into and say, okay, if you're in the WUI, then you need to have um, basically ignition resistant one, two, or three. And the three different classifications are one is the most severe or, or restrictive, then two, and then three is the least, right? And it all is based on basically a hazard analysis that we can perform before that neighborhood that is being built, or in our case, kind of the single family homes that are being rebuilt or modified or something to that effect, right, uh, of going through there. Uh, and then we classify that you're in a, a three, which is the least, or you're in a one, which is the most. And quite frankly, we don't have a lot of ones in our community. We, we could look at it and kind of think we do, but the fact that we have streets and hydrants and street signs um, really um, um, lessen that hazard severity quite a bit. Um, uh, for that particular item. So um, that counts for new construction and it counts for remodeled construction um, on that particular area. So I'm gonna say a couple more things and I'm gonna shut up. But 
Uh, the thing to start thinking about, the thing that you guys may get questions on or may have questions about is like, well, do we need to extend that interface further in to our city? And that's the type of things that myself and Chief Oliver, along with uh, uh, Will uh, in the building department have to look at, because there is a point where we, we could make the whole city an interface. But I think we have to look at that and say, is that reasonable to do that, right? Um, and the answer is no, it's really not reasonable to do that because one way or the other, there's always a factor in here that says um, this affects our building community as well. And we want a safe community and we want a sustainable, uh, hardened community. But that doesn't mean that the homes on uh, 22nd Street need to meet the ignition resistant construction that they do on 4th Street, something to that effect, right? There is that reasonable degree that we have to kind of look at and weigh cost versus probability versus what, you know, what, what we could plan for the absolute worst but we probably don't need to do that uh, continually. Do we need to modify some things that we have? Maybe, maybe we should. Um, has the Marshall Fire kind of shown us some items that we that we may need to modify? Yep, yeah, I, I think we were all in agreement on 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 that um, on that particular factor, but. Um, but we're okay. I mean, um, our level of building over the past decade now almost has helped us prepare for wildfire. It doesn't wildfire proof us, if that's kind of a, a word or a phrase to say, but it, it certainly has helped harden us uh, somewhat. Um, and it, it, once again, it accounts for new buildings and it accounts for remodel of existing buildings that fall within that uh, interface area. Okay, so I'll stop talking. I'll let Chief Oliver or Will take over on anything that they would like to add. Thank you, David. I'll add a couple thoughts regarding roofs. The local amendment requiring class A roofs uh, not only address the wooden shakes, wooden shingles, it also requires every new construction, every new building to have a class A roof and every re-roof of an existing building to have a class A roof. Now there are three class fire classifications for, for roofs, A, B, and C, C being the uh, least restrictive and A being the most restrictive. The only thing that we could do to make a roof more fire resistant than a class A is to require non-combustible materials. And even some metals won't classify as a non-combustible unless they have a non-combustible deck underneath them. So we're talking about a very cost prohibitive uh, requirement to go to non-combustible roofing and it wouldn't be very practical for large commercial buildings either. So we've, in my opinion, we've done about as much as we can do with our roof coverings. In the WUI code, if a roof is partially replaced within a 12 month period and more than 25% of that roof is replaced, they have to replace the entire roof of a class A, unless it already has a class A. So that's not in the building code, that's in the WUI code. So we have a couple of uh, other requirements that we've kicked in, uh, into effect. In addition to the roofs, Chief Lowry was talking about the difference between the roof and the siding. In the building code, we refer to the, the siding as cladding, and we do have requirements for that cladding to be either one hour fire resistant construction or non-combustible materials. There, there are a couple more options, but it basically comes down to uh, issues like that, either non-combustible or uh, one hour fire resistant construction. And that one hour fire res resistant construction uses the same processes and materials that we use in townhouses to separate units or we use in commercial buildings to separate tenants uh, and things like that. So it's the same kind of thing. And we have requirements for decks. The decks have to, the framing on decks have to be non-combustible. The decks have to be underpinned to within six inches of the ground. 
We leave that six inch opening for ventilation because the decks can get moisture and water underneath them. We don't want the mold and the uh, mildew underneath the deck, but the decks have to be underpinned because they become a collection point for debris. The gutters have to be non-combustible. The gutters have to have screening or something on them to keep from collecting debris. Even the ventilation for the roof is regulated on how we vent the roofs. So we make sure that we have them in the right locations where we mitigate to the best extent possible where fire can enter that building. Uh, it's been proven from uh, research and investigations that some fires and wildfire hazard areas have actually entered through roof vents and soffit vents and things like that and started the attics on fire and then burned down that way. They didn't come through the roof. So the WUI regulates the gutters, the vents, uh, the soffit vents, the roof vents, the siding, even the windows. The windows either have to be tempered or 20 minutes or multiple, multiple pane glass. Uh, the entrance door has to be 20 minute rated or it has to be uh, solid core. The only thing that's not regulated on the exterior of that building is the garage door, but the door from the house to the garage is regulated. Yes, Lisa. Oh, but this is wonderful and I, I appreciate the in-depth. I'm, I'm listening to this and thinking this is fantastic and I love it. And I'm also thinking I live in a house in the Wooly and my deck is made of wood. It, and so I think, I think maybe the, uh, and not giant logs, although that'd be kind of a cool deck, but um, um, so, so I guess kind of the, the other thing that I, I'm wondering about is sort of, I guess, code enforcement, which I know is always kind of the devil in the details. Um, you know, but we, it sounds like we have these very robust built, you know, codes in place to what, you know, how, I, I know that, you know, we get inspectors out, sometimes they're looking at things, sometimes people are going to do things without pulling a permit that they shouldn't do. Um, but what mechanisms are in, are in place to ensure that these excellent codes um, are in fact things that people know exist and that they're supposed to be meeting, especially like HOAs for multifamily. Um, and, you know, how, how do people get noticed if they have failed to do what they're supposed to do and they're in the WUI? Well, the first step is when they apply for a permit, we have a very competent, dedicated staff that does the plan reviews and they make sure all those details are addressed on the plans. And then after that, once the permit's issued, the inspectors go out and do multiple inspections to make sure that they're following those approved plans. So, so would that then... Um, not catch, for example, if, if you're replacing, not, not on the roofs, I understand the roofs specifically, but if you're replacing a wood deck within the WUI and not pulling a permit because you're just replacing an existing feature or replacing a window, perhaps, um, you know, how do those get caught? Does, it, does the code apply in that kind of situation? Well, if, if somebody does work without a permit, and I believe Hell is here, I'll let her address this, but it's my opinion that they have no legal standing uh, with that, with that uh, improvement, that if we find out about it, they'll have to take it down and build it to code. So I don't know if you want to chime in, Hella. Yeah, I would agree with that. And, and sometimes there are exceptions to having to obtain building permits, but the code requirements would still apply. But what you were describing, Lisa, may also be something that may have been potentially constructed before these codes came into effect. So I wanted to point that out too. So there's probably not been, that there is no similar requirement to what we had for the wood shingles. But if somebody would come in to replace that deck because it's reached the end of its life, then they would have to comply with the new code requirements. So that's fast. I'm, and again, like I'm, you know, I'm not trying to turn my HOA in. Nobody look at my address right now. But, um, uh, but that's definitely not happening in places. And I would say <laughs> we know that. Um, we don't know the specifics to that. But obviously, people are, are, are doing that. And it's very similar to what uh, Will said, that when, when it is found out, you know, there is a, a building code enforcement section in the city. Uh, once again, excellent individuals work there. Um, and, and they can go out and say, hey, listen, you know, basically, did you know you need a permit to replace your deck? And they're probably going to say no. And, and they may be telling the truth to that effect. Um, and a stop work order is issued and, and then they have to go in for permit and get the right material. And it's not, it's not always pleasant, but yeah, I mean, it's a matter of, of, you know, 
we can't, you know, when we don't know about it, we can't do anything about it. And if no one lets us know, we can't do it. And we're not asking you to turn in, you know, people, but it, it is, yeah, I mean, we're not, we're not um, naive to know that people are, are doing something like that. And replacing a single window or something like that wouldn't trigger the requirements in, in the WUI, right? It, it is, there is a kind of a breakover that Will and his team um, look at and say, you know, is this going to trigger, there's kind of trigger points that would have to look at it. A, a window because it broke or got moisture in it or something probably wouldn't be a, a single window on that trigger. John. You're muted, John. Yeah. Um, is there any control over what sorts of paint or stains are used on sidings? I, I know some of some paints and stains are very flammable. And uh, I know we recently uh, stained our place, but I don't recall that there were any controls over the, uh, the sorts of paint or the, the nature of flammability that, uh, that were relevant. Good to see you again, John. You probably didn't think I didn't recognize you, but you were, I was on an HOA meeting with John uh, a few weeks ago. Uh, and oh, this is weird. You know how weird things happen, people? Is This is, this is the second time I've had this question today, actually. Um, there, is, um, there is nothing in the WUI code that regulates paints or stains on it. Um, I would say, yes, paints and stains are flammable, but once they cure, they're, they're not flammable anymore, right? Once they have, have dried and you know, cured, finished, quote, oxidizing, um, basically, then uh, they, they, they're, they're no longer uh, basically create that hazard that they do when they're being applied and when they're still wet. Uh, so no, the code doesn't really uh, address that. I think I was at, I think my question today was, can, can, is there fire resistant paint that they can put on to help? And um, I don't, I mean, there, there is, but I don't, I don't, know if it's going to do any good thank you and uh then i was also wondering can you describe how much of an area is included in the uh the wildland urban interface say uh, along the west side of town for example how many blocks away from fourth street are is is included in that I think right now, 4th Street is our line. I mean, if you look up, um, you know, somewhere going along 4th Street, kind of the, the easy area, you know, if you grab, you know, Mapleton and go down to, um, oh, I just drew a blank on the street, but you go down that, that, that long straight part of 4th Street. I think 4th Street right now is our, our kind of our line on our interface. And, and that has been bumped back. When we originally drew it, it was, it was a few houses west of 4th Street. And we bumped that back over the, over the years, once again, prior to the Marshall Fire. And, and we, we continue to kind of look at areas that we, we, you know, we didn't kind of realize before, like, oh, that, that should probably be in in the interface. So I don't think we could put a square footage on it or, uh, 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 you know, like a, an area on it, but you can kind of look at that. And as it gets into the winding areas, we, we kind of think what's reasonable. Uh, and this is where Chief Oliver kind of comes in. We can also look at, you know, uh, what well, we can look at the interface. And then I, I have told, you know, Brian this before of saying, hey, I've got to look at this in a building sense, not, you know, when he looks at it in an operational tactical uh, structure protection, I'm looking at it with Will going, we have to look at this as what's reasonable in a building type situation, right? If someone goes in and says, I'm going to replace my deck and they do it right and they're going to go get a permit for it, um, do we need to look at ignition resistant construction for that deck of, based on their location? Yeah, to add to that, you know, the, the interface line per se does kind of meander, but about that fourth street, you know, for, for the building code is, is a good line to draw. Um, exactly to, to Chief Lowry's point, uh, tactically from a, from a strategy standpoint, um, in a response thing, you know, I would, 
I would classify almost everything west of Broadway as a, as a tactical objective as interface, but that's not reasonable for a building code standpoint. And it, and it really isn't even fair to try to apply that. So, you know, for, for applying the code as it's written and as we've adopted it, that, that you know, four street area, it really does, that's, that's where it makes the most sense. And I see Will also, you wanted to add something. Yeah, regarding decks, decks can be made of wood, but that is fire retardant treated wood. And most of the current fire retardant treated wood, you can recognize every piece of it will have stamps on it, but it'll also look like a bunch of staple divots in it where it's been impregnated under high pressure with certain chemicals that make it fire retardant. So uh, you can use fire, retreat, uh, fire retardant treated wood to construct decks. I do wanna say in answer to one of your questions, Lisa, most of the building codes are not retroactive. The fire code has retroactive provisions and so does the property maintenance code. Uh, but for the most part, the WUI code does not just like the building codes do not. However, the building codes are reactionary. Whenever we have recurring themes causing fatalities or massive losses, the building codes get updated and revised. And our international codes that we use are revised on a three-year cycle. Every three years, they go through enormous public hearings uh, and anyone's allowed to make a case for any code uh, change during those public hearings. So they are revised every three years. So it's important to recognize that for most of our incidents, whether it be seismic or snow or rain, we use a 2% annual recurrence event for that design criteria. For flooding, we use the one year uh, probability event. Now that's less frequent, but it's more catastrophic. It's a much larger event. So for mo most events, seismic and rain and snow, we wind, we use a 50 year event. As in my opinion, as these severe storms become more common and more catastrophic, the building codes will get revised to adopt new technologies and, to, and new requirements uh, to try to address that. But it, it's a balancing act because for every code requirement we add to the code, it drives the cost of construction up. So it's a real balancing act of what, what really uh, adds value to what we're trying to accomplish. Great, Sarah? Uh, I, I want to go, I, this is really fascinating. And I just want to go back. David um, said that there were some lessons learned um, from the Marshall Fire that you all are beginning to think about for the city of Boulder. And I'd really be curious to have you all sort of walk us through what, what those, what are the issues that you're looking at because of the Marshall Fire? Brian, you want to take any of those as far as, uh, I mean, they're not really building wise, I, I would tell you that. I mean, um, it's not it's not that the homes in Marshall, Louisville, Harper Lake area were built wrong. Um, and uh, sorry, Brian, I keep talking, but um, <laughs> You know, I, I've heard even on a state level that they're trying to look at uh, this type of situation. And, and what uh, one of the comments was is that we're looking at this, you know, in fire prone areas. And, you know, what are those? I mean, would we have come in and said that the Harper Lake neighborhood in Louisville was a fire prone area to, to wildfire? I don't, I don't think so. I wouldn't have called it that. Um, I wouldn't have um, looked at it in, in any sense. And I may even not have looked at, you know, the Sagamore neighborhood, the neighborhood that was behind Target. I mean, yes, it back to a grassland open space. Yes, that is interface. Um, but, you know, I wouldn't have looked at it and said, you know, that or the Elements Hotel that, that burnt in a, in a concrete you know, more concrete than we'd like to see in most areas. So I think there's some, a, a lot of talk going on about hardening the building um, 
but I don't, I don't, I don't know if that's the fix quite, quite honestly. I, I, I think it, it comes from uh, other areas. I think, you know, more communities that can, um, can look at hardening building in that, uh, that areas that they identify as interface. I think a lot of communities are now realizing that these, um, uh, fingerling pockets that, that add these green belts, um, that, we all love and and and, and want to live by I got went out my window right here matter of fact i like it so um are a, a form of interface and and those maybe those decks that go along that that is that is part of the interface and 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 we we had already recognized that if 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 we're not perfect, but we had already seen that. And some of those finger leans that come into our city and some of the inner pockets in our city we look at those homes surrounding that as a type of interface area and that building needs to be hardened uh, up somewhat if if they go in for remodel or permit or something to that effect right um and i think some other communities are looking at that and saying yeah you know we don't back to the flat irons in that area but all of a sudden they realize we do have uh, urban interface in our community now so yeah, to add to that, you know, the, the, the lessons learned there for, for some of those communities is, is, is things we've already addressed as, as Chief Lowry's, you know, talked about our, our adoption of the Ruby code, uh, you know, ember screens over attic vents, uh, you know, uh, class A roofs, uh, concrete board siding, all of those exist, you know, ignition resistant uh, construction materials those homes in, in Superior and Louisville didn't have that because they weren't considered interface. So that's, those are some of those places as, as far as lessons learned that, that communities are looking at is, you know, are, are we in the interface? Can, can this area be considered interface and should we, you know, move to a, a more restrictive building code, even in areas that aren't technically wooey? Um, the other things that, that our, our lessons learned are, are more driven tactically um you know from from like my perspective of of, of how do we um attempt to battle a fire once it becomes that conflagration you know that that stopped being a wildland fire uh pretty quickly after it you know once once a, a home or two uh ignite that that growth is then you know geometric it's exponential it's home to home ignition at that point it's no longer wildland fuels so mm -hmm no matter what wooey code, even if, you know, Sagamore or Louisville had wooey codes and had them all in place, once that first home and given the conditions that were faced there um, started, that's really how that progressed. So, you know, we're looking more tactically as how do we, you know, engage in a, in a place where there's that, that residential density and, and where can we make some, some places to, to stop that, that home to home ignition spread. Thank you. And I have a question I'd like to ask. Um, one, one thing that I've always been curious about is defensible space with landscaping. And uh, that I do see uh, language in the international code on that. Um, so number one, you know, maybe if you could just talk a little bit about the importance of defensible space and whether that can be, uh, again, enforced or, or monitored. And then number two is, um, do we have any defensible space standards with, um, outside of the urban wildland interface? I was hoping to avoid that. <laughs> I got to be honest with you. That's yeah. a tough one. Go ahead, Brian. Yeah. So same same story, right? It's the code's not retroactive. Um, so we, we can't go in and force somebody to say, hey, per the code, you have to cut these trees down that you've had in your yard for you know 50 years. Uh, so that's part of the issue is, is we're not in the... Um, the enforcement game. Uh, we do uh, both curbside and detailed home assessments to, to, to help educate homeowners that, to, you know, defensible space and home hardening is the thing to do, uh, but we, we aren't in a place yet where we require it. Um, and that's possibly a conversation we have farther down the road as far as, as you know, uh, code compliance or, or D-space enforcement. Um, they do have some of those kind of ordinances in, in some of the California communities, uh, but I don't think we're there yet. Um, but yeah, it is, it is a huge um, way to uh, help 
the community help itself by by doing some defensible space. It, it's not a catch-all, you know. Um, our own disclaimers, you know, all over all of our our assessment, you know, documents and reports are. You can help, and you can help yourself, but there's no there's no cure-all unless you're going to make your house, you know, out of concrete with no windows. And I don't, I don't know anybody wants to live in a in a concrete house with no windows. So I'm going to jump in here, and I I want to make one small correction. Mm -hmm. Um, that part of the Wooly Code is um, retroactive, right? Um, chapter six, get into chapter six, uh, and it applies to new and existing construction. Um, we, as a, a city, um, we did amend that section uh, based on several factors, right? It does apply to new construction. So when you see um, a home that Will has done a, a building permit on or a development, um, they are required uh, landscape-wise to comply with the defensible space standards um, outlined in basically chapter six. It's a, it's a landscape type thing. Um, here's, here's kind of the New construction. The, work, right? the irony on that, right, is as soon as Will issues a certificate of occupancy, it's no longer new, it's existing, right? And so literally day one, it, it went from being new to existing, and we did amend that out. Now, we amended it out for a few reasons. One, one was, and what Lisa had brought up in, in the very beginning, was enforceability uh, of that one. We simply don't have um, the ability to enforce that. And that is, and it's not an excuse, but it is reality, right? It is a staffing issue. It is a time issue. Um, and there's also the factor that um, our community, uh, as well as most communities, don't, um, doesn't really have the tolerance uh, for that type of enforcement, okay? Um, and not even af after the Marshall Fire are they going to have the tolerance um, for something to that effect. And I can, I can give examples, um, but people don't want, um, you know, um, us to come into their backyard and tell them to remove the mulch around their house and replace it with rock, right? Uh, that is not something they want to hear. What they do, what they do respond to is Chief Oliver and his team that do come out and do an assessment. And when they say, you know, a recommendation would be to remove the mulch, uh, the wood mulch that surrounds your home and put rock in that particular area. We would recommend trimming this tree up, not cutting it down, but trim it, trim it up. I think one thing is, is some education that we are working on and we are trying to get um, uh, reach more people at is that defensible space does not mean that you have to cut your trees down. Um, no one is, is saying that the tree that you planted when, um, Lisa, I saw your note. You said, I'm, I'm still here, but I got baby things, right? When you planted a tree, when, when, when your child was small, does does not mean that we're going to come in in 20 years and say, you got to cut that tree down. You know, it's not what we're saying, but the tree does need to be maintained, right? For health reasons and for other reasons, that tree has to be maintained. And sometimes limbing that tree up where the limbs are not hanging on the ground and creating a ladder uh, for that fire to move up into that tree and over onto your house is what we're recommending. People are receptive to recommendations. They are not receptive to enforcement in that type of situation. Uh, we saw it when we had the Flagstaff fire, very apparently. Um, so when we did adopt it, we did make a conscious decision that um, if, we, if, we, if we don't have the means to enforce it, we, we probably shouldn't have it on the books, right? Um, it's just something written that we're not doing and we didn't want that. And then just the tolerance in our community and, and how we thought. And we had planned at that time that to up education on wildland and what defensible space is. And we've been doing that over the years. It's not easy, um, but, but um, 
but we've we have come a long way with with Chief Oliver's team and um, assessments either from the street or for detailed assessments when requested. Lisa. Um, thank you. That that's very helpful. One of the things that um, I'm wondering about, and I don't think we're going to make a decision right now because we'll want to keep hearing from you guys. Um, but is kind of what planning board could potentially do or not do as makes sense, um, you know, to kind of set, we sometimes send mid year recommendations to council. So we always do end of year at their request. Um, and then we'll sometimes we'll also send mid year recommendations. Um, we're appointees, we're not elected, but we have a little more cover to make certain kinds of recommendations. I think anything, if that's something that there's uh, a, 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 if other planning board members are, are interested in doing that, we'll have some new planning board members coming on who may or may not find that a good use of time. Um, I think one of the things I've learned from this conversation is I'd really want to make sure um, that we send it over to you and, you know, we, we may or may not take all of your suggestions 100% wrote, um, you know, to, to edits to our anything we're thinking about, but um, I want to make sure that you have a lot of expertise and earned knowledge from trying to help people who maybe didn't see some of what you're doing as helpful. Um, and so I think we want to take that into consideration. Uh, one other thing I want to mention, I, I think the residential sprinklers were also waived. Um, how much of the, of the, no, they weren't for, from the recent WUI. I can't remember, Hell, if you were the one who told me that. Sorry, Hell, I don't mean to call you out. Um, we didn't waive residential sprinklers in the most recent WUI. Yeah, we have, the, we have the residential sprinklers adopted. It doesn't come from the WUI code. That comes from the international residential the international, code, right? Okay. Um, we didn't adopt it in 2012 or 2013, ah. but we do have them adopted now for new construction, new construction. right? New yeah. construction. So that's really like a house being built, ground up or, or scraped and, and rebuilt. Cool. Perfect. Thank you for um, correcting me on that. And I think, um, Will, did you have something to add to that? Yeah, I, th I think part of the confusion might be in the 2018 WUI, there is a provision that new construction has to be sprinkled. And I think they put that in there because some jurisdiction, including Boulder, took that requirement out of their code adoptions. And Boulder just adopted sprinklers for newly constructed dwellings in the last code edition. But for jurisdictions that amended that requirement out of the code, the WUI code would come back and say, if you're in WUI, you got to put that sprinkler system in. So all new houses in, in Boulder now require sprinkler systems. Wonderful. Thank you so much. That makes sense, Will, and, and where the confusion came yeah. from. And, um, and, and as far as retroactive on the WUI side for building code requirements, I want to make sure that uh, clear. When I said the code's not retroactive, what that means is when somebody pulls a permit to work on their house, Everything that they knew, knew has to meet current code, but it doesn't force them to go back and improve areas they didn't want to touch. Okay, so it doesn't make them go back. It's not an all or nothing code. So it doesn't make them go back and improve things that they weren't intended to work on under their permit. But all the new work has to meet current code. John, did you have a Oh, you need to. Yeah, thank you. Um, so this is extremely interesting and relevant. And uh, as the parent of a, of a daughter who lost her house in Louisville in that fire, I, I am really appreciative of your comments. But we also uh, had a, a non wui fire that the Pearl Street condos uh, a few months okay. ago. And I'm just wondering if you have any, uh, if what lessons, although investigations may still be ongoing, I'm just wondering if there's any relevant lessons we can draw from that also that we should be thinking about. Familiar with that fire. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> I'm kidding. Um, lost a little height from that one. So um, yes, no, a little bit of both, to be honest with you. Um, it was another kind of situation where we kind of had not the perfect storm, but um, certainly uh, an unusual situation. Um, all six buildings are sprinkled, or were sprinkled um, in that particular condominium complex. If I could take you and show you, uh, the sprinklers did work. Um, and if you looked at some of the, the units, they're, they're not they're not burnt, right? Uh, the fire started on the exterior um, of that particular condominium complex, and it started at, you know, you know, 
three between three and three thirty in the morning. Uh, so it went unchecked for um, a good long time. I mean, we were dispatched at uh, three thirty two. Um, our, the sprinkler alarm, uh, was received at the monitoring station at 331. So sprinklers had already activated, but sprinklers are not on the exterior part of that building. Okay. And so once again, here's kind of, um, an irony that the, the building, I, I, I believe, you know, as far as sprinkler wise was, was, was up to code. Um, it was, you know, we put in in 1984. So it was certainly, certainly met that and sprinklers aren't required on the exterior of those types of buildings. Um, when I when I look at the most recently published um, international fire code, there is a specific a, a specific provision now added um, in the 2021 uh, code, which we don't have adopted at this time that would require sprinklers on those exteriors of the building. And the latest edition of the, uh, in the standard that regulates um, multifamily residential sprinklers would also require sprinklers where it didn't in the previous edition and all the ones prior to that. So that fire happened just a little, you know, I mean, the buildings were built and, and the codes have kind of changed somewhat um, in that particular time. Now, it would have made a difference um, in that particular fire, right? I mean, that was all regulated. Um, it was all wood siding, true wood siding, like wood, wood siding, not even composite wood siding. Um, and then the, the way those things are built, it kind of just created this tunnel, per se, of radiant heat, and, as, and the fire just went straight down there. It obviously went upwards and it got into the attic, which is not required to be sprinkled. Um, and it's still not required to be sprinkled, but it went up and it got into the attic spaces of those, which made it very difficult to uh, fight. And then access obviously um, is, uh, was also difficult at that location. You know, We had Pearl Street, we had 23rd Street, we had a nice parking lot on the east side. Um, but yet, you know, you know, we could we can't get in the middle of those buildings the way they were built and the way they could be built today as well. I'm not asking to change that. Um, I'm not asking to drive a fire truck down the middle of those. We wouldn't do that to start with. But um, but it was there was several things that came into play in, in that particular area. Um, I have released the investigation report, um, so it is public now. Oh, I, I wasn't aware of that. Yeah. But so could the same building be built today with only those, but and it, not even external sprinklers are yet required? Um, the answer is yes. Um, they could. Um, as we sit right here, I'm kind of working on... Um, Hella, take your earphones off. You shouldn't hear any of this right now. Uh, I am trying to work on maybe doing uh, an amendment of what's in the current um, published fire code to add that to what we currently have adopted right now. So future buildings would uh, be required to have that um, on, on them. Um, and then we automatically by our ordinance, we automatically adopt the latest edition of the installation standard uh, for that one. So that would require those um, egress balconies that, that were made of wood in that particular construction. It would require them to be uh, sprinkled uh, because we do have that latest edition of, of um, that sprinkler uh, uh, installation standard already adopted automatically. So just to, to follow up, uh, if I might, what what does this indicate to us for the WUI type uh, prevention standards? Uh, should we be thinking about external sprinklers on houses in WUI? Uh, no, I don't think so. I, I, I think we have to look at it um, um, in, in, in what's reasonable, right? Um, I don't want to price the sprinklers 
out. Um, you know, I mean, there, there, there is a cost associated with all of this, right? With um, our energy code, there's a cost. With our um, uh, ignition resistant in the WUI, there's a cost associated with that. And at some point, you know, it cost has to be considered, right? And, and there's a cost of putting sprinklers in a residential occupancy. And I don't want to over uh, out, you know, prices out of, of, of getting the benefits that the sprinklers do for the inside of the home and protecting of the occupants and protection of our firefighters um, and the environmental uh, impact that, the, that, they, that they benefit in that sense to make them so expensive that people can't build in it um, for, um, for the benefit that they would do. So no, I don't think we would be looking at putting external sprinklers on homes that are built in the WUI. It would be too cost prohibited. And there, there's other technical issues about when they come on and are they taking, you know, if they, if we, if a bunch of them come on in that sense, are they taking water from Chief Oliver and his team that need to be connecting to the hydrants or pulling water from that particular area, right? Um, that can be, that can be performing uh, other suppression and structure protection in those types of areas. So um, there, there are systems out there. I, you know, that, that are, that go along roof lines and uh, on the exterior uh, parts of the houses. If people wanted to put them in, they could, uh, but I don't think, personally, I don't think we want to make that a mandatory requirement um, for us. Well, I, I think it would be uh, very interesting if you were to provide, you know, costs and assessment of costs and benefits so that others could uh, review that and see what they think about it too. Mm -hmm. Will, did you have something to add? Yes, thank you. Uh, Chief Lowry mentioned working on an amendment and Lisa had previously asked about what this board could do. Mm -hmm. To my mind was that in future code adoptions, whenever somebody is proposing to amend the code to a lesser standard, Make sure you've considered every side of the coin to that before you before you do that. And the sprinklers is a perfect example. Boulder, like many other communities, exempted that sprinkler requirement out of that. That came into the codes in 2009, and we we exempted that out until last year. So just when somebody's proposing an amendment to make the code less restrictive, remember that this code is a minimum standard. This is the least people can do when they build a building. And so make sure if we're going to do anything that makes the code less restrictive, we need to make sure that we weight all the all the um, issues that are involved in it. You, you, you guys did. You guys supported it back then, but council. You know why didn't. it was exempted out? Just just curious. Yeah, I do. I do. I didn't tell you guys, I was like 6'2 one time and I'm like 5'10 now. So it was, uh, it, it was a process. Um, and, and, I, and I am serious, your predecessors in the planning board were um, fantastic in supporting the sprinklers back then. Um, we did not adopt the 2009 code, I would tell you that. We went from the 2006 to the 2012. So when we did start adopting the 2012, which is basically in 2013, something like that, um, we had we had the support of planning board, um, and that was fantastic. Um, but then, um, as I said, the adoption process was hitting in uh, 2013 in the fall of 2013. So quick history lesson, what happened in fall of 2013? Um, it was literally being heard by city council um, days after um, we had the 2013 floods. Uh, not that that was the per all the reasons there was, um, you know, council, you know, weighed their options and with 100% um, you know, I didn't agree with it, but with 100% respect of what they were doing and, and their responsibilities, they, they did not feel like it was necessary at that time. To put it quite honest with you, they just um, didn't feel like it was, it was something that we needed. Um, and they looked at costs, they look at maintenance, they, you know, um, you know, 
that that was their decision, right? Um, as I said, I didn't agree with it, but I do have to respect the job that they have and that they that they thought was right at the time. Um, and this time, city council, we did have planning board support at this time as well, which was always appreciated. Um, and this time, it was I think it was. It was a non-issue. They they knew that they knew that we needed to bring in those minimum standards. Yeah, and I don't think it was necessary. I don't know that it was necessary. You know, the wrong call. All I'm suggesting is right. that make sure that it's an informed decision. Yeah. When when you're going to take something a requirement out of the code, make sure it's an informed decision. Yeah, and I and I think it was at that time too. I mean, I it was again. I didn't agree with it, um, but I have to respect the job that they had and that they were doing. So. Mm -hmm. No, I'd like um, maybe Hella could help us with this bit. Um, do we does um, planning board see all proposed changes to Title Ten in the land use code or in the uh, mini code, or is that? Uh, I think if I remember it correctly, I think the charter requires you to be notified of changes, but we've always um, the, sent them to planning board at least as long as I've worked on them. Uh, they've come to planning board for a recommendation before they've gone to council. There's not a requirement in like a Title IX. There's mm -hmm. a requirement that any before any change of Title IX is adopted, that the planning board make, make a recommendation, but it has been our practice. Thank you. Lisa? Yeah, so I just want to acknowledge one that we're kind of pushing up against our self-imposed deadline and yeah. get you guys off to do more fun things than this. Um, I don't remember if it was while I was still employed at the city shortly before I left or, or just after I'd left, I, I wasn't in the room. Um, but I worked in communications and I had a lot of colleagues and I'm sure you guys were there as well um, for a tabletop that modeled um, a wildland fire moving into the city. Um, and very quickly, uh, according to the model, we were confronted with hydrant failure, um, which as we know, uh, happened in the Marshall fire and they were very creative um, and, and were able to work around it with some uh, true heroics um, and also a, a rapid uh, fog of war kind of decision to, to go ahead and use untreated water um, in order to keep the hydrants working. Uh, and I think people are also going building to building to turn water off because they were just, you know, gushing water. Um, and, and that just made me think of it with the sprinklers and, and so on. And so, you know, I, I think we, we don't want to step on the toes, the toes of our, um, you know, code enforcers. We don't want to create more conflict. I think the world has enough of that right now um, and of people getting mad at each other. Um, but to go back to kind of what, what Will brought up and what I brought up earlier, you know, what, what can we do to support you, you know, and not get in your way? You know, if, if you, and you don't necessarily have to answer right now, but you know, if there's sort of a, a wish list of like, please don't do this, you know, but it sure would be nice if someone would take this up, you know, um, I can't promise that any of it will go through, but I think this is very top of mind right now. Um, and a board like planning board, um, and maybe we could even talk to OS, you know, BT, because I, I also think about things like, and I'm not proposing mowing always, but control burns, maybe some thoughtful mowing occasionally. Um, you know, what, what can we push up to the actual electeds um, to maybe make a difference for the next time this happens? Um, because it will happen again, hopefully not with a Chinook, but it will happen again. Mm -hmm. I appreciate that, Lisa. It, it, that means a lot, actually, knowing that that you guys are, are open and, and willing to listen to, to, to things like that. I think planning board always has been. Um, so yeah, yeah, thank you very much for that comment. I would just also add, our utility department is nothing less than like rock stars. Um, they are, they have, once again, well before the model Marshall fire, Brian and I have sat in there and they have modeled wild land. And I think Brian and I were like, yeah, but we're not going to need that many hydrants, you know, and, and, and maybe, maybe we would, but they have modeled it to no end of showing um, what our, our supply can do in a wildfire situation. Yeah, we, we, we built out several scenarios for them to, to actually model, um, one, one being what we would call a, a, a typical, um, you know, wildfire day, um, which, which closely modeled uh, that tabletop you're talking about, Lisa, um, and then one that, that we considered, you know, <laughs> sadly, we didn't consider Marshall fire worst case scenario, which I, we will now, 
Um, but but what we called at the time the worst case scenario and, and the water system held up based on their their modeling capacity. So uh, I feel confident that 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 kind of issue won't happen. But again, you never know. Great. So yes, um, we uh, thank you, Lisa, for helping uh, keep us kind of on on time here. So it sounds like. Um, uh, well, first of all, I want to say thank you so much to all three of you for spending the time with us. Um, it sounds like you are open and uh, and would love to hear from planning board members who might have ideas. Uh, Lisa, I think you are kind of really interested in kind of uh, helping us keep keep this an item of discussion. And uh, um, if if anyone would like to, you know, uh, pair up with Lisa to kind of work on this a bit um, over over the next weeks, it might be a retreat topic or it could come up earlier, but um, certainly there are possibilities that if there are ideas that you'd like to bounce off our wonderful fire department folks, that would that would be make sense. Lisa, did you want to add anything to that or just take it? Oh, no, no, that was good. I was just going to say if, if anyone really wants to work on it, it isn't rotating off. Um, I'd love that, but I also think it might be um, Hopefully we'll get a few more snow days. Um, and uh, uh, so it won't be too urgent quite yet, um, but maybe we wanna also talk to our new members once they come on um, and you know see if anyone has a real interest. But we're thinking of probably doing like a two person breakout so that we don't run into having to notice. Although lots of people are interested, we could always figure out how to notice it and do it um, that way. Um, you know, and, and then maybe bring some stuff back to the board as a whole, just, just so we don't take up too much time from the everyday stuff that we also have to do. But um, yeah, I, I just thought, I was like, oh, we're, we're approving stuff all, all the time. And, I, and, and and the new build, I worry about less, but um, you know, how much of this is just gonna burn? <laughs> you know, and, and that kind of puts into perspective what it is that we're doing here. So um, yeah, if anyone's super keen on it, let me know. And otherwise maybe we'll look at it once we get our new members. Great. All right, well, good. Well, thanks, thanks again. Uh, and uh, thanks for for going the entire seventy five minutes with us. It was very very uh, useful. Any any last uh, comments you wanted to add before we move on? Thanks for having us. Yeah, awesome. thank you very much. We're happy to do this anytime. Thank you. Great. Yeah, there's so much of uh, of our safety that we uh, owe to to you all, and uh, and it's always uh, heartening to know that a lot of this building code stuff just happens kind of because it's there and we we can focus on other things and so uh this this has been very educational so thanks again thank so with you that much. yeah great with that we'll go ahead and uh let's go ahead and take a, a short break um and come back at 7 25 to go to our public hearing item uh, let people get a chance to stretch their legs
<clears throat> All right, I see people coming back. Lisa, is PFAS outlaw or is PFAS prohibited now in Boulder County? I don't know. What is PFAS? Okay. Sorry. The forever chemical that was they put in water to make it spread more to combat fires, but then it I don't know. Okay, got it. I don't know. Um some of that gets kind of interesting at the state level. Like I know one of the reasons we can't, it's not the same thing, but one of the reasons we can't um ban certain pesticides and herbicides in the city is that some time ago the state legislature after some uh intensive lobbying from industry um passed a law saying that you're not allowed to ban pesticides and herbicides at the city or at the um home rule or county or city level um so i i don't know i don't know if we have the ability to regulate that and i don't know if it is regulated but it'd be good to look at all right well, thank you. I guess, John, you're going to be turning your camera on shortly. So um, there you are. Great. So um, with that, we'll go ahead and uh, reconvene. Uh, our next uh, item is a public hearing item. Um, Shabnam, thanks for joining us. Uh, we'll be doing uh, your first uh, concept review. We've had uh, call-ups from you and things like that. Uh, this is a concept plan review and comment for a redevelopment of the property located at 2900 East College Avenue into a multi-unit student housing project with 39 dwelling units, which includes a mix of one, three, and four bedroom units. Parking is proposed to be provided in a two-level parking structure, primarily below grade. The proposed building is four stories above grade with a rooftop deck, uh, reviewed under case LUR 2021-00046. And before we start, um, I'll just ask if any board members have any conflicts of interest or relevant ex parte that they would like to disclose. Uh, I went to see the site. Mm -hmm. Great. John, also a site visit. Yes. Uh, I've also visited the site. Okay. Great. All right. Well, then I guess we're good to go. So um, I'll hand it over to Charles to introduce the item. Yeah, thanks so much. Um, and again, good evening, uh, chair members of the board. It gives me great pleasure um, uh, to turn it over to Shabnam Bista. She's a planner in our office. Tonight is her very first concept plan review presentation. So we're very excited for her and she'll be presenting uh, the analysis this evening. So Shab, please take it away. Thanks, Charles. I'll just go ahead and share my screen. It sometimes takes a minute. <clears throat> I know we tested this before. Are you able to see the um, intro slide? It just says City of Boulder. Not yet. Not yet. Not yet. Oh, interesting. Be um, sure and hit the, it may look like you're sharing your screen, but you got to hit that last share button oh. down the bottom right hand there corner. That's correct. I've done that a thousand times. <laughs> there we go. Okay, so, great. Now we can see it. Great. Thank you. Great. Um, good evening, planning board members. Um, for tonight's discussion, I'll be presenting a proposal to demo the existing residential building at 2900 East College Ave and redevelop the property with a four story building up to 55 feet in height. Um, the number of units proposed requires a concept plan review under the land use code prior to an application for a site review. Uh, to briefly go over some presentation highlights, I'll talk about the purpose of the concept plan, um, public notification, surrounding context for the project, um, and summary of proposed project, as well as key issues that staff identified. As this is a concept plan review, um, the purpose is to determine the general development plan for um, this particular site and to help identify key issues in advance of a site review submittal. 
This step in the process is also meant to be a dialogue between the applicant, um, staff, the community members, and planning board. So no formal action is being taken tonight on the project. Uh, in terms of public notification, a uh, written notice was sent to property the owners within 600 feet, and the notice was also posted on the property. Staff did receive comments from neighbors regarding solar access, parking concerns, and the building height, and the correspondence is included in the memo packet. Uh, in terms of location, the approximately half acre property is located east of 28th Street and 28th Street Frontage Road. Uh, south of Colorado Avenue and west of 30th Street. The existing property um, is a two-story multi-unit residential building with 14 units. Um, there's access from the east and west of the building to the units in the rear and the parking along the side of the property. Um, with the site towards the rear of the property, which is the south property line, um, there is a steep grade change, and these are the retaining walls that are existing. Um, so the elevation change will require some special design consideration. Um, the site is designated as high density residential on the Boulder Valley Comprehensive Plan. Um, the area is located close to the University of Colorado and consists of attached residential and um, apartments with higher density. Um, consistent with the Boulder Valley Comprehensive Plan designation, um, the zoning is residential high three, so RH3, and is intended to serve areas in close proximity to the university as well as planned um, transit-oriented development. The area to the east and directly to the north of the property um, are zoned uh, residential eight high fives or H5. So just to provide a little bit of um, background and context for residential, for RH3 zoning district, this is the highest density zone district in the city. Um, the intent of RH3 zoning is to provide redevelopment opportunities for areas of the city that are in the process of changing to high density residential use. Um, so in 2004, the area to the northeast along 28th Street Frontage Road um, was rezoned from transitional business developing to um, RH3. And the zone was established to implement strategies adopted by city council at the time um, that would permit higher housing densities on parcels adjoining um, the University of Colorado. And RH3 was established to meet the city goal of providing more housing in the community, particularly in this case for students. And the character of the area is identifiably high density residential with a variety of multifamily um, residential developments. So in terms of the built environment, these are just some examples of um, high density residential apartments along 28th in the RH3 zone. Um, so the high density buildings include student apartments such as landmark lofts, um, as well as the hive to the south. Uh, and they and both of these buildings also requested a height modification. Um, the property to the north and east of the site in the RH5 zone are generally one or two story residential buildings. And there's a mixture of uses in this area varying from high density apartment buildings to commercial and office uses as well. So the height, um, so the site is highly accessible to existing multimodal transportation network. This includes convenient bike and pedestrian access to the 28th Street underpass, which provides direct access to CU campus. The site is also well served by public. Several transit stops are located less than a quarter of a mile away on 28th Street, Colorado Ave and 30th Street as well. Um, the site is also well connected to, oh, sorry. This is a slide. <laughs> 
The site is also well connected to other open space areas such as Scott Carpenter Park and the Boulder Creek Path, both are a half mile away, as well as the CU East Campus. And these can be accessed through on three bike paths and, multi and multi-use paths. Um, and then the CU main campus uh, is also accessible through the underpass on the 28th Street frontage road. Uh, so moving into the proposed project. So this uh, site is located on East College Ave. The existing property is a multi-unit residential building. Um, and the proposed project is for a four-story multi-unit um, residential building for student housing. The proposal also shows landscape and shared open space improvements to the site. The project is proposing 39 rental units on the four levels. Um, the development design is the development is designed to serve the city student population um, and would consist of two one bedrooms, 24 three bedrooms, and 13 four bedrooms um, with a total of 39 residential units. Um, there are 89 parking spaces located in the two level parking garage, mostly below grade. Uh, and then there is the rooftop deck for residents as well as um, the interior courtyard. Um, the proposal includes open space in the form of private and semi-public usable open spaces. So the private spaces will be the uh, balconies for the dwelling units and the Semi-public spaces include the rooftop deck as well as the internal courtyard. And the internal courtyard is on the first floor and has access to all dwelling units with um, a raised walkway connecting the upper levels. Uh, the applicant is also requesting an open space reduction from 60% required in the RH3 zone district to 30%. Additionally, the applicant will also be asking for a height modification at the site review stage. The project will be eligible for a height modification, but subject to community benefit requirements. And the applicant intend to pay cash in lieu for inclusionary housing and will be paying an incre increased fee based on the um, increased floor area above the zoning height limitation. So the building design is um, contemporary with materials like composite wood siding, brick, uh, and colored concrete, and will fit within the character of 28th Street frontage. There is main ground floor entry and outdoor seating located on the north side of the building along College Ave. The building also slightly steps down to the northeast um, in that northeast corner. The site is located in Solar Access 2, um, which is intended, intended to protect rooftop for solar energy system. So the applicant will need to demonstrate that they meet the solar access, access standard during the site review. So moving into um, the key issues. The first one being whether the proposed concept plan is compatible with the Boulder Valley Comprehensive Plan. Staff finds in general that the plan, uh, the concept plan is consistent and met with many of the goals, objectives, and recommendations, um, particularly related to housing policies. Um, the provision of student-oriented housing near the university and near several major multi-corridors could help to offset in-commuter trips by students and would also alleviate student pressure on the overall housing supply. Um, the next key issue is whether the height, mass, and scale of the proposed buildings um, is compatible with the character of the area. So the proposed building would exceed the permitted building height of three stories and 40 feet in the um, RH3 zone district. Um, and then as mentioned before, the applicant is asking for height modification to allow the structure to go up to 55 feet. And um, it is possible, but would be subject to community benefits for inclusionary housing. In terms of compatibility and care and um, with the surrounding area. Although there are one and two story buildings to the east of the site, um, the newer developments along RH3 zoning district 
um, and in proximity to the 28th Street frontage road are higher density buildings. And these are some of the examples. Um, the proposal is consistent with these newer developments and buildings in terms of mass scale and height. And um, it'll also be compatible with the general vision for the RH3 area. So the last key issue is whether the proposed open space is appropriate in design character and usability for residents per the site review criteria. Um, generally, multifamily development and student housing should, um, student housing open space should break up the density mass and scale of the development. Um, it should also be programmable for the needs of the residents. So the applicant is asking for the open space reduction to 30% from the required 60%. And this is based on certain review criteria. The flowchart is trying to show different types of open space to meet that um, the reduction, um, specifically highlighted in the red circle. Uh, and so the proposal shows the internal courtyard and rooftop deck as part of the open space. However, at this time, um, they're not specifically meeting that criteria. Um, the interior courtyard would need to be at least half of that 30% of the reduction. Um, and has specific criteria that it needs to meet as well in the open space um, code. Okay, thank you for your time. Um, and I'm here to answer any questions that you might have. Great, thank you, Shavnam. <laughs> Great presentation, we appreciate that. Uh, so let's go ahead and uh, open up this. Uh, to questions from the board. Who would like to kick us off with questions? Joji. Shabnam, thank you for the uh, presentation. It was, it was really great. Um, congratulations on your first one. Thank you. <laughs> uh, I had a quick question regarding, you had brought up uh, two other projects sort of adjacent to this, one where, I forget the names of them, but one where the SIP was formerly on the corner there, and mm -hmm. the other one um, uh, kind of similar scaling as that one. Uh, my question relates to, how those projects dealt with open space versus this one and this request, um, because their massing does seem somewhat similar. So I'm curious about their open space as it relates to this project and the percentage that they met. Sure, um, I actually have not taken a closer look at the open space um, for those projects. Um, Charles, do you have any information? Yeah, um it's a great question. Actually, I, if memory serves me, every project along the 28th Street frontage in the RH3 zone district has taken advantage of the opportunity to reduce their open space based on the um, criteria that's in the code. Great. Sarah? Um, okay, so just a couple of questions that have again refer to the open space there i realize it's concept plan but there's no indication of where for example they'd have racks and if the bike racks were to end up in the courtyard would that still be considered open space or would that would that reduce even further the percentage of open space in the courtyard so um I think based on their floor plans their bike racks are actually located on the first level of that garage, the garage that's below grade. Okay, then that, my question is moot. And my second question is actually just a, do you happen to know what percentage of CU students actually commute into town? Because the argument being made here is that this will alleviate or help to alleviate in commuting and reduce pressure on housing uh, stresses in Boulder. Um, but I don't know how many students commute in. I fortunately don't have that number. But I think I might be able to dig that up while we're continuing the conversation. Okay. That would be very helpful. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Let me see what I can do. Great. And uh, John? Yeah. Thank you. Uh, I have the video off because my connection is unstable. So maybe that helps a little bit uh, in the signal. Um, 
I was interested in in uh, staff's attitude towards the comments raised by the uh, owner and attorney for the property to the uh, east of this proposal, which is, uh, you know, one story uh, houses around a, a big yard, and there are concerns about the impact on them. Uh, what does staff think about that? So um, I did take a look at that um, email that came in with the comments, and I'm just going to stop sharing briefly. Um, I think the initial, the first concern was that it's not necessarily compatible with the surrounding area, especially with the Timber Ridge apartments, I believe, which are to the east of the property. And the Timber Ridge is located in residential um, high five, so RH5. Um, I believe that I think the there are some concerns with the um, noise as well on the rooftop deck, potential noise. Um, in terms of it being compatible, I believe just given the examples of um, properties that are in RH3 and to the south and west of the project site, um, I think the massing and, and scale is is relatively compatible and it being RH3 as well, the intent of this zone district is really to, um, you know, to go into um, high density residential adjoining and, and, you know, properties that are close to the University of Colorado to provide more housing for students. Um, and I think the, the other, other question, question or concern, concern that they had, had was regarding the excavation of the, um, parking so it going to uh two grades below i mean two levels below grade um and some concerns about uh, i believe it's groundwater um i think so i don't think we regulate the groundwater and um in terms of the um, excavation i think it would be on the applicant to pump the groundwater um and i think these are kind of um details that would be looked at during the permitting process if it makes it that far. Thanks, Shabnam, great. So follow up. Um, Did you, you. Want to, uh, you want to follow up, John, or shall we? Yeah, if I can just follow up quickly. Uh, I was interested but, uh, <clears throat> beyond what is the standard uh, permit there um, and I think a setback on the east side to diminish the impact on the on the uh, single story uh, folks to the east. So you were you were breaking up pretty badly, John. Um, uh, my uh, what what I heard was that you would uh, like to hear. Oh. Um, would you like me to try to rephrase what I think you asked? And then yeah, we'll go ahead. <laughs> so I think I think you were asking to expound a bit beyond uh, what the code says uh, to uh, address uh, whether um, there could be additional um, step backs considered on the east side uh, to help with the concerns of those neighbors to the east. Is that what you were trying to get at, John? That's correct. Shabnam, did you want to? weigh in on that one sure um i think one of the strategies that the applicant um, is implementing here is to just kind of step the building down um towards that east side or at least specifically northeast side um yeah i think great yep. um, we do have um and i guess i would expand on that um, we have site review criteria that talk about compatibility um, so if the board felt like they wanted to have um, a conversation around what it would look like to, um, you know, degrade some corners or try to help um, alleviate some of the, the mass on a uh, neighboring property, I think we have site review criteria that can help support that conversation. And maybe the applicant could speak to um, how they're treating uh, the building on the downward side of the slope um, as part of their presentation. And Shabnam, I can ask the uh, applicant this too as well, but um, I don't know if there is any flexibility on uh, location of the rooftop deck. Uh, is it to, is the uh, west side to 
too tall to put a rooftop deck on, or would that be a possible place to relocate it if it's considered a little bit further away from the properties to the east? You happen to know if that? Um, I I don't happen to know that answer. Um, yeah. Well, I can ask the applicant that too. Right. Sarah, did you have a question? Uh, I did have sort of a comment and a question. So the comment actually kind of follows up on John's. It was very hard in the drawings to actually perceive a step down from the fourth four stories to three stories. And I don't know if that's just the drawing or if that's an issue um, to at least put on the table uh, that it that perhaps a, a, a clearer step down would could would be valuable. So that's the comment. Um, the, uh, and now, of course, the question has gone right out of my head. I'm so sorry. I'll come back to me. Sorry. That's fine. I, I actually had another question, Shabnam. The, um, the, I didn't see that uh, the, the number of parking spaces being proposed is a reduction. Is this the, are they parking this out to the, what the code? Is there, okay. Yeah, so, so there is no reduction. It's um, 89 parking spaces that are required, and that's based on, um, dwelling units um, and that's what they're proposing. Okay, well, we can talk about that during deliberation, whether uh, a, a small parking reduction, especially those outside spaces might give some flexibility on design. But um, anyway, um, yeah, Sarah. I remember now, <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. Age is catching up with me. Um, the, the width of the courtyard, I mean, I realize this, again, this is just a drawing, but it looks like a very, very narrow space uh, that may, maybe from a square footage perspective meets the code, but it may not meet the intention of the code. So what is the width of that, of that courtyard? I don't know if I have that information. I know it's approximately 3,430 square feet in total on that first floor. Um, perhaps the applicant can provide that information. We can ask, um, ask that during the applicant yeah. presentation as well. Yeah, I don't see dimensions on the drawings. Any more questions? Great, all right. Well, with that, then let's go on to the applicant presentation. Um, I know that we have um, Eric Hartrump here. Hopefully I got that last name sort of pronounced correctly. Close enough. <laughs> and Eric, uh, we normally uh, do 15 minutes for a presentation. Would that be a good amount? Sure, cut me off anytime you want. All right, thanks, Eric. All right. You, sh you should be able to show your screen. Okay, I will do that right now. Everybody see that? Yes. All right. Uh, well, thank you all for uh, having us here tonight. Um, we've sort of been working with uh, the owner of the property for quite a few years. Um, some uh, minor additions and renovations and trying to keep the buildings going. And uh, it's to the point where they really need to kind of fish or cut bait with the the buildings that are there because they do need um, some work. And so this uh, proposal um, has evolved. Um, we've had a pre-app with um, Shabnam and the rest of the staff and uh, actually reacted to the, um, the comp plan issue of density with a, a slightly larger building than we were originally uh, considering, um, I think that everybody realizes that there's only so much um, land in this area, uh, proximity to the university um, to build out, um, to meet the goals of the zoning that was established here. So um, the owners of the property agreed to take a look at a, a higher density um, project than they might have originally uh, before that zoning, certainly before the zoning was changed. So as you know, the uh, landmark lofts to the uh, west is uh, really, it's a five-story building because the parking podium 
um, pokes out of the ground full story on the east end. So you've got um, four stories um, on top of the parking podium. So that's a five story building. Um, in back here, uh, I think Union 970 or whatever they're calling it now, I think it was called the Hive for a while, um, rises up uh, from about a 30 foot hillside um, to four stories plus a podium um, to the south. So clearly the density has changed uh, over the over the years in this area. Um, so uh, again, just kind of showing the, the context that Shabnam has already shown. Uh, one thing, obviously, this is a major pedestrian corridor uh, from a lot of different housing stock to the east of campus. Um, so. Uh, College Avenue is a thoroughfare for pedestrians. And so we understand the importance of making the pedestrian experience as good as we can make it. Uh, one thing I, as we go through this, I'd like to maybe have you comment on. Um, we did get a comment from um, transportation about a detached sidewalk here, as opposed to an attached sidewalk. The entire neighborhood, including directly to the uh, east and west of the property is an attached sidewalk like this. Um, one thing that this does afford us is a little bit better uh, offset from the actual building and an ability to do more landscaping, obviously something more uh, significant than what's there now. Um, but uh, so I'd like to talk to staff about reconsidering that uh, kind of condition that they've um, put out there. Again, this is the Landmarks Loft property over here. Uh, this would be directly uh, adjacent to the property. You can see this is the entrance to their parking garage. And they have a few surface spaces here. And mainly it's a utility area back here. Obviously, there's no landscaping. Um, it's all uh, basically pavement and utilities um, in this area. Um, the property to the east uh, is a two-story apartment building. And uh, obviously, if you look to the east of that, it's part of a uh, development that um, spans multiple blocks to the east and to the south and um, <clears throat> was sort of typical of that era. I believe this is 60s, could have been 70s, but I believe it was 60s. And, uh, you know, this building that we would be replacing is of a similar era and similar scale. Uh, obviously, before the pressure um, for housing in Boulder has reached where we are today. Um, to the north, uh, I believe this property is actually um, in part of the rezoned area. Uh, maybe Shaman can correct me on that. And then the property to the east of that is in the RH5 zone. Um, and even in the RH5 zone, I think you could see higher density than what is existing there today. So uh, I assume that over time, as those buildings are retired, you're gonna see some higher density in this neighborhood. This kind of gives you that overall, here's the 2900 college, and this is that property directly to the east. And again, these buildings just continue rambling on to the east, quite a bit of that. And they're very similar to the building that's directly north. <clears throat> Our context, for this zoning district is obviously the, the newer buildings that have been built um, along 28th Street and, and into this neighborhood. And I believe that the reviews that have happened um, talked about stepping down uh, towards these neighbors and that you can see what they've done. The, the upper floors are set back um, on both of these buildings, uh, same different developers, but the same kind of strategy. So uh, to respect this property, then this, this building, uh, the fifth floor actually was set back. Um, and, you know, they're in the same zoning district, um, but they, they use that kind of, uh, of a, a strategy. Um, and again, primarily courtyards. <clears throat> um, we've used less courtyard and more roof deck for our open space. Um, and we've been having conversation with Shabnam about the, um, the details of uh, meeting the requirements of the, the municipal code in terms of that open space 
And I believe we'll get there with the um, quantity we have. It's more about the details of how it is um, uh, actually um, fitted out and accessed and so forth. So um, again, the design drivers that, that we really you know, try to follow on this project, uh, trying to establish early in the in the project. The, obviously, for the owner, it's replacing the older buildings, and you know they need to have a return on that investment. So they're looking at what level of density. Obviously, the underground parking um, does increase the cost. We looked at surface parking, made a decision that the underground parking would be a much better use of the land. This is a fairly narrow lot compared to some of the other properties that have been redeveloped in the area. Um, obviously, the uh, meeting the comp plan um, goal for the, the housing density. And then really what we're trying to do, and we haven't got there yet, but we're definitely working on um, how to really create a rich outdoor experience, uh, which is hard in this urban environment, but I believe that we're going to accomplish it. We do have the space to the south of the building that we'll talk about where the terraces are um, for some pretty unique landscaping there, which obviously hasn't been developed yet, as well as the roof deck, which I think, you know, we can have passive and active areas that can be really special. Um, and the other thing is really have a unique sense of place for residents. I think that the roof deck in particular is going to set this project apart from a lot of the other properties in the neighborhood, which have these courtyards, which are deep between the buildings, as opposed to having the, the deck on the roof. <clears throat> um, and as far as the architecture goes, we'd also like to try to set this building apart from the other buildings. They all have their own uh, aesthetic. And instead of trying to like copy something that is already there, we really tried to create something unique uh, for this site. Uh, we are providing the total number of required parking spaces on site, uh, and we won't have any surface parking. Um, you know, that really is the way to maximize the utilization of the site. And, you know, we've done quite a few of these um, below grade parking garages. Um, and one of the things about groundwater, you can either treat it and pump it out, or you can uh, keep it from coming into the basement, uh, what we call the bathtub design, uh, which doesn't um, put the groundwater out onto the surface. It keeps it underground. And so that's the, the technique that we are pursuing right now is what we call the bathtub. So there wouldn't be any pumping of groundwater um, for the parking garage other than during construction. Um, obviously, we want to respect the adjacent neighborhood. Um, we believe that there will be redevelopment of the other properties um, as time goes on. So we don't see this as a static condition uh, adjacent to the property. Um, so with that in mind, try to do the best we can today and then work towards um, what the future will probably ultimately be in this area. A little bit about the, the decks and so forth. So here's the front yard. And again, you know, there's an attached walk here today and it goes all the way down the street and around the block and comes up the other side and all the way up to 28th Street frontage road. Um, again, it's an attached walk here and then it does dip in and then I believe it dips back out in a place up the road. But um, we would like to not uh, encumber the, the front yard, which again spans uh, from the building to the to the walk, uh, I believe it would not be as good of a pedestrian experience. And actually, if you walk along here, you, you'll feel that you kind of are um, encroaching on the uh, residents <laughs> privacy when you're that close to the building. And so this to me is a much better uh, application for the sidewalk in this area. Um, so we do have, you know, obviously, we want an animated front yard, if you will. Uh, we've got this terrace garden in the back that we really need to uh, make an active, useful area because it's the area that gets the most light, even though we do have quite a bit of shading from this building directly to the south. There are times when this will get a lot of sun uh, on the ground. And so we think that can be a really special place as well for gathering. Uh, when you get up, you know, the courtyard goes down the middle of the building. Um, 
I, I believe um, uh, Board Member Silver was asking about the courtyard width, and it does vary in width from 30 feet down to around 18 feet. So it kind of undulates as it goes uh, through the building. And uh, then up on top, the uh, roof garden, roof deck would be open, obviously, and not encumbered by uh, walls beside it. Uh, we did put it on this side of the building uh, because there are some views out uh, from once you get up to that area. If you snuggle it up against this building, then you pretty much cut off all the views from the deck and you also start to get shading from this building. And so we'd really like to take advantage of the of the sun and the just the ambiance of, of you know having some views and so forth. Um, there is obviously some expense in putting this on the roof, so try and maximize the benefits of it. I think <clears throat> I think we can show acoustically that sound generated up here is not going to go down, you know, across these parapet walls and the setback to this area. Um, it'll mostly be reflected upwards, um, and there's studies that kind of show how that would actually work. So I think in site review, we can get into that a little more uh, deeply. <clears throat> one of the challenges of the site is we do have these shared access drives on each side. There's one on the east here, which they use for their surface parking, which is currently used for the surface parking along this edge for the, for the 2900 property. And then this shared access, really will not be used by 2900, but will primarily just be ingress egress for uh, the lofts project. Um, and that's the way it's platted. Um, there's a easement to each and a, the other property along here as there is over here. Um, there's also some utilities and so forth that run through this area. But when you look at this parking garage, um, it's not, as efficient as we like to design parking garages, primarily because this width right here um, that we're bound to, uh, to, to be able to give these access drives enough width. Um, so we've got uh, almost 50% small car. Um, so our drive lanes are wide enough. And then this is a single loaded corridor over here going to the next level down. So again, very inefficient. Um, Again, not the way we'd like to design it, but we got it to work in two stories. If we squeeze this building any more narrow, then that would probably be a three-story underground parking garage, which would be incredibly expensive. So we'd really like to try and work within the envelope that we have that makes a parking garage work under this building. Otherwise, I think we'd probably come up with a whole different concept. I don't know what that would be. <clears throat> uh, when you get up to the units, Again, you've got that uh, internal courtyard, which is really on the first floor. Every um, unit has a, a private deck. Again, we'll, we're working with Shabnam on making sure we meet all of the requirements for uh, the open space to count as it should. Um, and then as you go up, the floors are similar as, as you rise up. Uh, with the fourth level, you can see how it steps back from the third level creating uh, private decks, pretty large private decks. We also stepped the north side back quite a bit um, and created a large uh, public roof deck area uh, on the north uh, east corner. <clears throat> so you can see that here, um, that northeast corner, and then these are those private decks, and then up onto the uh, main roof deck and roof garden, and again with an exit this way, exit this way. We're, because of the height, um, we weren't able to bring the elevator all the way up to service this. So we're trying to figure out, I think as far as the ADA counts, we, we meet the letter of the law, but we would like to meet the um, intent, I think, of open space uh, in Boulder, which is to have it accessible for everybody all of the open space accessible to as many people as possible. There's obviously places where you can't provide total access to everybody just because it becomes impossible. For instance, these terraced areas where there might be stairs, uh, we could get them to part of it, but certainly not all of it. Again, we were getting them to part of this, but not all of it. Uh, we're gonna try to figure out how to get them all the way up to the top here. Um, 
And I think that um, we did hit 15 minutes, but it's, oh. but the clock okay. still says 100. We can go another minute 45 or so if you. Okay, <laughs> I'll I'll speed it up. I apologize. I just get to talking. Um, another thing we're trying to do is pedestrian scale uh, amenities on the ground with this plaza at grade um, up front. And again, you can kind of see we've got our ADA access to the uh, main level of the parking garage uh, as well. And that's the access for the elevator to all the levels uh, for the ADA. So we'd like this front to really be a nice entrance, um, you know, if you are uh, have a wheelchair or if you're able-bodied uh, either way um, and that's this area here for that main entrance and we have the stairs that go up to the uh, the main plaza deck level um, again we've tried to use materials to break down the massing <clears throat> uh, again we're stepping up to that building to the west uh, we have asked for some variances we'd like to do some um, significant overhangs um that would be into the setback clearly they're not going to interfere with any traffic or anything else but i believe that it does help to um uh, it helps the aesthetics of the building uh, as well as uh these uh, projections in the front of the building that would add a little more um dynamic uh, aesthetic to the building and so again you can see that hillside rising up to this property, which then again is a four story on podium. So quite a bit higher than our building, but in the same zoning district. So from the north, you can see there's only a couple stories that poke up above the hillside there on our property. And that is it. Great, okay. Um, and I would like, I, if, if I could address the questions that were asked, I'd love to, um, to just get those, on the table you have some uh, written, written down and we can also have people re-ask them too. I, yeah yes i did um i did write those down so that i could respond okay um i think um board member ensign you asked about there is there a reduction in parking and again we're trying to accommodate the full parking requirement um i believe that <laughs> when we get the costs in, the um, owners might be real happy to have a parking reduction. So what I was thinking of um, proposing is getting an approval for some parking reduction. Um, I know their intent is to build it all, but again, as things change uh, and prices have been going through the roof, it might be a really wise thing to uh, go for a parking reduction. This close to campus, I really think it makes sense. Um, I just think that they wanted everybody to have a place to park their car, you know, so from a one, marketing standpoint. Yeah, one of the reasons I asked the question, and um, I think you covered it, um, that is shared parking to the east, That and it's not actually your parking. So none of those spaces are surface parking. Uh, that is correct. Yeah. And so there would be no shared parking with the East. They would have their parking. Okay. The so they, yeah, I was wondering if you had any sort of uh, leeway into reducing some surface parking. Okay. Yeah. Cool. Um, there, uh, I think we, I don't know, um, Board Member Silver, if the drawings with my cursor running around helped you to see the roof deck and the step down. Um, I <laughs> certainly show you again if that would help. But um, again, this is concept review. And I think as we go forward, we'll have some different angles and views and renderings that are gonna be a lot more uh, detailed. So hopefully the things that we do and the things that we talk about today uh, will be a lot more evident as we move forward. Um, again, I think um, board member, Gersel, we, I, I kind of addressed the width of the building and how a further setback on the east will just push the parking garage down into the ground uh, further and, um, or make it just not work, not be efficient enough. So um, I think as we go up in the building, maybe we can look at more modulation of the building on that east side, uh, but um, it'd be really tough to take that footprint, you know, which is it's at the setbacks now, you know, it's sitting right um, at the setbacks. And if we push that in from the required setbacks, 
any further, then uh, that's really going to be a problem to make the parking garage work. Um, we talked about a little bit about the excavation and the groundwater. Um, and uh, you guys have probably looked at projects that do it either way. Um, the project at Canyon 28th Street, the hotels and the office building, you know, we've got both a treatment uh, facility in the basement for groundwater that seeps in from the slab. And we've got a bathtub wall that keeps the water from coming in from the side. Um, but again, you have to kind of look at each strategy. Downtown Boulder, lots of bathtub projects down there. The Trinity Church we did, that's a bathtub. Um, Cajun has a parking garage in that uh, facility. And so that doesn't eject any stormwater to the uh, surrounding neighbors. Um, it just keeps it from getting into the basement. Um, and we'll talk a little bit about the noise on the roof deck. And I think we can do some more studies and things that might help with those uh, concerns when we're going through site review. Um, we know we're going to work on the open space in detail and um, the massing and so forth. Uh, happy to have any input that you guys have for that. So. Great. Well, that, um, I think you covered the questions that I heard from before. Sarah, did you want to kick us off for more questions? Yeah, just sort of, can you, that open space in the uh, southern edge, um, it's not really clear to me what is back there, right? I mean, like, what does it connect to? What are, what else would be on that southern, in the, um, what else is not what's there right now, but on the buildings that are to the uh, to the east and west, what would that connect to? Would that and would that be an enclosed space? Would it be a terraced space? I'm just it's very is it narrow? Is it wide? Like it's a little un, unclear. Sure. Um, it's uh, it's fifteen feet wide, so it's not it's not terribly wide. Um, and to the west, uh, can I share my screen again, if you guys don't mind? Sure, if you can get it. Okay. Um, this is probably as good as anything. <clears throat> Just... Hello. <laughs> I'm not seeing it. What's going on? Looks like it went from the title slide to the end of the slideshow or something. But... Stopped. Okay. Let me try it one more time. I'm sure I can get it to go. Stop. I think I turned off the uh, PowerPoint. So. It says it's paused. I'm not sure why. Can Can you guys see my screen? Yeah. We can see it. It looks like there's a slideshow menu that's kind of frozen. Oh, that's interesting. And maybe if you, you just maybe you could just describe it to us. Okay, apologize. Um, well, what I see on my screen <laughs> is is that uh, uh, sort of overhead Google shot that um, shows there is a uh, fire lane. Oh, I wish you could see this. It's so helpful. Try this one more time. Are you seeing that? Your cursor is moving around now. Um, it could be that you're just sharing your. There you, we go. There it is. Do yeah. that. Okay. I'm gonna I'm gonna keep it right there. Um, so to the south, um, th this development has a fire lane that runs all along the north side of their property and then exits over here, um, and that's really their open space, you know, on the north side of their property. Uh, the Landmark Lofts has this sort of interesting um, set of paths and it's kind of a trail that runs through there and these stairs that actually come up and connect with this um, fire lane. And they created this very tall, I think it's 30 feet tall in places, a retaining wall that runs along here. So this this is kind of a valley between the building and that retaining wall. It's not real nice in through there. On our building, what we're planning to do is to bring the grade up 
behind the building so that it can access into our courtyard and also be closer to this grade than this lower grade. And again, there's about a 30 foot difference here. So um, we'll be about you know two stories up into the air here where we terrace it off and hit the back wall of our building. And, uh, and then that will enter into the courtyard that goes through the center of the building. Um, and then there'll be stairs that come down to here as well. But the main access would be if you're in your unit in this central area, you can go up or down and walk out onto this uh, landscaped area. And again, since it gets sun most of the seasons and most of the day, um, it's going to be a pretty nice area and we can plant some large trees. And so I think this is going to be an opportunity area for us in terms of landscape, whereas the roof deck is limited in terms of what you can do in terms of trees or large shrubs that have a canopy, things like that. Um, so, so we're kind of looking forward to how this really um, gets animated. And I don't know if that answers your question, but um, I, I suppose that uh, we would need to get some easements or something because this is all private property in through here. So there's really no um, sort of legal access onto their fire lane, if you will. So we'll, we'll keep our activities in our area, um, but it might be possible to do what this property has done, which is to access that, which gives you a nice pedestrian thoroughfare, you know, up to 28th or back into the neighborhood. Okay. So. I think that might be a really good thing if we can negotiate that. Okay, thank you. Great. More questions? John? Yeah, uh, thanks for the presentation. Uh, I think in the, the letter that your neighbor to the East wrote and uh, their concerns, and I'd be interested to learn how you uh, propose to respond to them? Well, um, the my client is currently out of town. So we I just saw this letter today and we haven't had a chance to really digest it and figure out you know, how to respond. Um, I think that I'm proposing that we reach out to that neighbor and really start a dialogue. Um, lawyer, letter, lawyer letters are never a good way to have a dialogue. So um, I believe that the best thing to do would be to um, talk about the things we can do, the things that we believe are um, within the purview of the city site review process, you know, that we're certainly, you know, need to comply with and um, uh, try to, do what we can. Obviously, we, we don't want um, neighbors to not be happy. Um, so I, I just think that it's <laughs> a little bit inevitable as you, you know, march into these older neighborhoods. Um, but I think uh, try to be as good a neighbor as we can and figure out what are the real concerns. Okay. More questions? All right. Well, if there are no more questions from the board, thank you very much, Eric. Uh, we'll yeah. um, come back to you after the public comment. Uh, uh, so with that, let's go ahead and open up the public hearing. Uh, so in this uh, segment, each speaker will be allowed three minutes to speak uh, on this uh, project. So. Go ahead and raise your hand. I only see a couple of attendees out there, so both of whom spoke to us during regular public comment. So Harmon and Lynn, either of you want to raise your hand? Otherwise, Lynn, go ahead. You can unmute and address us. Are you, are you able to unmute Lynn? Let's see. Now I am. It took the wall there. Actually, I think I hit the button to unmute or to allow you. Okay. Um, 
No, 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 no. Nope. No way. This is the, the epitome of the reason to cap you, CU enrollment. You can't be put in this position. Eric is a very nice guy. We can't have this in Boulder anymore. Stop! Oh Stop! My Stop! 30, 60 to 30%. Open space reduction, no. Height modification, no. Cash in lieu increase on height limit, no. Solar greenwash, no. No overhangs or projections. 1.11 violated. 1.12 violated. Jobs housing imbalance. Community benefit, no, 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 no. You think these people are gonna hang out in a friggin' court yet? No, they're going to the open space and we can't. We're 300 million short on our open space. Jesus, this is not feasible anymore. There's a war. Snap out of it. Wealth inequality does not work anymore. Greta Thunberg said, people are suffering, people are dying, entire ecosystems are collapsing. We are at the beginning of a mass extinction and all you can talk about is money and fairy tales of Eternal economic growth. How dare you? Greta said that. This is Lynn Siegel. How dare you? Stop. Do you know? Each one of you will vaporize just as fast as the others in this war. Nobody gets away with an atomic bomb. And this is directly what happens. This obscene capitalism, this obscene passion for density and growth is exactly what that gives us. Vaporization in an atom bomb. Seriously, folks, seriously. This is not funny anymore. The US conducted the coup in Ukraine in 2014, look up Vic Victoria Newland. You got my message yesterday. Get educated. If you're in this position, you need to spend the time to understand where you're, where you actually are, what you're actually doing, what blood you have on your hands in Ukraine from this development here at 2900 College today, right now. You are conducting this genocide. Stop. Thank you, Lynn. And um, we appreciate your passion, but uh, if you could try to um, use words that are a little less um, four lettery <laughs> in the future, that would be appreciated. Uh, that's part of the, the what uh, staff asks, but we appreciate your passion. All right, um, with that, uh, let's go ahead and ask, uh, um, Eric, did you have anything you wanted to respond to? I don't see any other hands up um, in the uh, public hearing, so we'll close the public hearing. Uh, I have no response. Okay, thank you, Eric. Great, so with that, um, we'll then, um, let's see, we're at eight, we, we've um, only got an hour since the last break, so let's uh, go on through and open it up for deliberation and see how uh, far we get uh, before we might need a break. Um, let's see, organize my, my notes here. All right, so uh, we have uh, three key issues uh, that uh, um, Shabnam uh, put together for us to drive our discussion. Uh, during this deliberation, uh, it is a concept review, so we'll be sharing uh, reactions, um, ideas, and uh, um, and suggestions, but uh, we won't be making any decisions. So uh, with that, uh, uh, the first key issue is, is the proposed concept plan compatible with the goals, objectives, and recommendations of the Boulder Valley Comp Plan? Any uh, one want to speak to the BVCP? Uh, Sarah? Um, I just had a bit of concern, and this actually will feed into key issue two as well. The lack of a parking reduction requ request 
Um, I'm not really sure how that would fit into the chapter four uh, climate action objectives of the Boulder Valley Comp Plan, especially since the one of the selling points, so to speak, is that this is located so closely to campus and to multiple multimodal transportation options. So I'm a little concerned about um, the, and I realize we're in concept, but um, I it would be, and I think it might make sense to look for ways to reduce parking. So that's my comment about key issue one. Great, thanks, Sarah. Uh, Lisa? Yeah, I, I agree. And it was nice um, to hear from the applicant that uh, they thought that might be reasonable to look at a parking reduction. I think just particularly on this side, I was sort of surprised not to see it. So um, I would agree with, with bringing that forward. And as you mentioned, it also, there's very little more expensive than a building an underground parking garage in Boulder. So um, it, it might be positive um, for other, other reasons as well for the pro forma. Um, otherwise, you know, I, I have some specific things around design and and uh, so on that other planning board members have started to touch on, but generally speaking, I think, um, you know, the use and the type of building and so on for this location does seem consistent. Overall, um, parking was the big thing that stood out for me there. And I'll, I'll have more refinement conversation later uh, as we go along. Great, thank you, Lisa. Uh, yes, Georgie. Um I am curious on the open space relative to that sort of deep, narrow uh, light well. You know, it kind of reminds me of a light well in a, in a big city. And I just, it's hard for me to conceptualize. Um, I would love to, when, when the applicant comes back, um, understand a little bit more about what that would look like in there and how a human being would interact with that space and what actually grows in a space like that. I, I just, I don't have, it's, it's hard to, for me to, to visualize what that courtyard looks like at 18 feet wide um, and, and three or four stories deep. So just a comment. Great, thank you for that. Um, uh, Peter. I think there are several components of BVCP that it does comply with on to and on balance. Um, I agree with Sarah and Georgie's comments, though, about the courtyard. I've been talking about ice in uh, shadows for five years on some of these things uh, because they may look good on paper and satisfy some part of the code and allow a project to move forward, but then they're really difficult. And maybe it's the property manager um, memories I have, uh, but it's uh, it becomes a problem and people don't use it. As far as the parking, um, it seems, like Lisa said, there is little that's more expensive uh, in Boulder than, uh, or anywhere really going underground parking. It's, you know, it's 60 to 70 or 80,000 a stall. I don't even know what it is now. It's somewhere in that range, I'm sure. Um, and there being no reduction. So it almost seems as if it was um, part of the strategy to pull back or get, I know that not everybody wants the reductions. Um, I know that reductions will result in students driving and parking all over this neighborhood, uh, but that's you know no reason not to try to keep pushing on that. And if it does bring the cost down and it allows for uh, the improvements that we're going to want to see on various aspects, then um, I'm okay with that. I didn't mean to jump around there. Sorry. Number one, I'd say mostly yes. Great. Okay, well, I'll um, also uh, go ahead and, oh, go you, you go first, John, go ahead. Sorry, I think I had a window. Yeah, thank you. I, I, think that, I think that Sarah's and George's and Peter's comments reflect my thoughts also. I, I have to say that I think in general, this is, uh, fits in with the Boulder Valley comp plan objectives for, for this location. But we'll have to talk uh, separately. 
separately about the details so but I have to say that I am very, very skeptical about the courtyard with so many floors. And uh, I've Okay, thank you. Yeah, you're breaking up. Next time we might have you uh, turn off your video when you speak, but I think we got got that. Uh, uh, just there's a little bit of breakup. So I'll go ahead and uh, weigh in on key issue one. Uh, yes, uh, there, there are plenty of uh, BBCP policies that are just that justify uh, the uh, DRH3 uh, type of uh, housing in this uh, block. So I think that yes, I agree with um, with the other board members on that. I also uh, agree, and I think that Shabnam did a really good job of uh, talking about there needs to be a careful design of the open space. Uh, the courtyard does concern us when we see something that that narrow. And uh, uh, so I think I totally agree with the comments that were made on that as well. So I think we've got a lot of uh, people kind of agreeing on that. So when it comes back from site review, we'd want to see how that uh, is designed and activated. Uh, and I also agree on the parking reduction. Um, if and especially if um, I was kind of hoping, <laughs> for some reason I didn't notice that that was shared uh, access with the with the parking for the neighbors, and hoping that maybe there was some service parking that could be reused. But anyway, the um, yeah, uh, if it, if the parking could help with some other design uh, aspects, um, uh, a parking reduction would be interesting. Um, Finally, uh, we want to make sure. I saw good bike parking down in the garage area, but uh, there probably wants we, we probably want to see some good uh, surface uh, bike parking for guests and people who want to quickly walk up outside. Uh, EV charging uh, on site would probably be good. Uh, I'm sure that's probably required. Um, yeah, so that's probably most of the BBCP. Any other passes through that issue one? Great, okay, key issue two then, is the height, mass, and scale of the proposed buildings compatible with the character of the area? And be, well, um, before we go to Joji, I'll just make one quick comment that um, I think, uh, Eric, you mentioned uh, you weren't sure about how the property directly to the north was zoned. That actually is RH5, um, as well as the property to the east. So we, it is kind of on the, northeast corner of RH3 bordered with by RH5 to the north and the east. Uh, so I just checked that. Uh, so I thought I'd throw that out there. Go ahead, Georgie. Uh, yeah, I, I, on that set of criteria, I, I think it does overall. I, I would um, pay attention a little bit to that neighbor. It sounds like um, there's discussion and dialogue around that. The, 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 the massing of the building is very blocky. Um, it's not terribly articulated. Uh, and so I know this is early on, um, but I would urge the applicant to really put some more interest in articulation in the building. Um, but I think the scale in general fits with especially that block going towards the university um, outside of the, that massing articulation that I, I'd like to see a little bit more visual interest and in, and obviously paying attention to the to the neighbor on the uh, on the other on the other side who voiced that concern. So. Great, Sarah, and then Lisa. Um, so I concur with what George just said, um, and I would um, specify or raise a question, which is what is presented as a setback. Um, I'm not really sure it's a setback. You've just it's it's a it's a patio that goes all the way out to the edge of the building, which will be used as living space by the people who live in those apartments um, on the fourth floor. So I wouldn't really call that a setback. And um, I, I think that that's something that um, I'd urge the applicant to um, address in a meaningful way going forward. Um, Personally, I mean, I, going over to that neighborhood, I drive by it when I come back in from the airport, but I've never really meandered around there. It's a, it's a very, um, 
it's on its way to being extremely heavily built up. I know that that meets the um, interests of the Boulder Valley Comp Plan providing housing for students. Uh, but these huge buildings that don't have much green space uh, has, makes it a, actually not a very pleasant pedestrian experience. Um, and I, I, it's, this is not necessarily specific to this project, but more to the whole area. So if this project could figure out how to have some more green space that would um, make the pedestrian experience better, that I, that I would be in favor of that. Great, Lisa. Yeah, I concur um, with my other planning board members. You know, I think overall it is compatible, um, but as I kind of alluded to earlier, um, I'd like to see some refinement. Um, I was looking over, uh, I think it's at the surrounding neighborhood, um, figure eight, which shows some of that surrounding context. And you have some interesting um, roof lines, you know, coming in, whether they're curved or kind of coming toward the middle, which makes me worry about drainage, but but does look cool. Um, you know, and so I, I would just, um, invite the applicant as as you kind of look at what to do with that um it, it does have I, I know that it's the kind of highest and best use in terms of using every square foot but um it does have a boxy feel and i would hope that the next time that we see it it might have a little more interest that's not just cladding and different materials but um actually some some architectural interest um and i again you know legislating design or trying to direct design is always tricky but um hopefully that's enough broad strokes to give a direction um, and then I'm, I'm curious to see how the conversation goes with the neighbor. I, I think one thing I would mention and something we have at times asked for or um, further along the concept review um, is a step down when we're moving between different zones. Um, I'm not sure whether that's 100% necessary here, but if you're looking at ways to vary that roof line, to vary the built structure, um, you know, and depending on those talks with the neighbor, uh, one option might be without making it too much of a wedding cake, you know, can you kind of do that transition down toward them um, and into that other zone. Um, so I just wanted to throw that out there again, it may or may not be exactly what you end up doing on the site, but it's certainly something we've seen before. Um, and at times that we've gotten relatively forceful about which I'm not feeling at this moment, but I'd be curious to see how you kind of uh, manage their concerns and manage the transition. Um, I think that's, oh, and I really appreciated Georgie's comment earlier. Um, it would be really nice to get an aerial or a fly through or some cross sections or something of, of what that courtyard is, because I agree that I'm a little confused about um, how it works, you know, and so um, I, I'd like to better understand the, the function of that and how, how it would behave. Thank you. Great. Peter. Hi there. I loved everyone's comments. I do think that it fits with what's been going on in that area, for better or worse. And the design, I know, is just conceptual, has actually kind of grown on me in like a mid-century modern kind of way. Um, maybe it's the fact that I was at Fleming Law Building for a bit, and it brings back memories. But it's interesting, and I, I think it does fit. And uh, look forward to watching this from the public as it gets to you next. Great. Okay. Well, I've, I've heard a lot of uh, really good ideas from the board. Um, I won't repeat uh, repeat uh, what other board members have said, really, but I'll say that, uh, you know, I agree with most with everything that's been said, I believe. Um, the, um, the planning board can recommend that this go to DAB. Um, I don't know that uh, what people think about that. Um, it, it could be a, 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 a not as not a huge DAB night or, or it could be you know because it's not a huge project you know that big of a project compared to some that dad looks at but uh you know it could be worth it um i think that uh, the staff really identified by uh needing to make the corner um the, uh, the the north facing and then maybe around the corner uh towards the parking entrance uh more uh street activated more street friendly uh dab could probably help with that kind of thing uh, and I do kind of agree that with that, although I kind of also agree with Peter that I see pretty good signs uh, that, that it's going in a good direction uh, and also uh, pretty compatible with the other buildings. So um, I think that, you know, through the, the design process, 
uh, it should it should look really good. And I'll, I'll just quickly touch on one thing we haven't talked about was this attached sidewalk. I mean, if, if our transportation folks are, you know, th that's something that just really has to be worked out with transportation. I don't know that I have any really strong opinions. I find that it's a little um, without a good, <laughs> you know, plan to get the whole block kind of upgraded to a specific level. Some of these things can be kind of piecemeal and not particularly useful. And uh, this is a quiet street. It doesn't connect through to either uh, th uh, Highway 36 or 30th directly. So it's, you know, there's gonna be a lot of bicycles going in and out on the street itself. And uh, uh, so having pedestrians walking next to the parking cars doesn't strike me as anything too terrible. So in my, my opinion, I sort of agree with the applicant on that. I'm not sure how uh, worked up I would get about trying to uh, pull that sidewalk away from uh, the, the parked cars, uh, just because that's the way it is around the block. But at least you want to weigh in on that. Oh, no, I'm sorry. If someone else wants to weigh in on that specifically, uh -huh. um, they should do that before I say my thing. And otherwise, we can go to you. I just, uh, I don't know if anybody has strong opinions on that, uh, but that's, uh, I certainly wasn't. Great. Okay, go ahead, Lisa. Oh, there, there's just one thing I forgot to mention, um, and that is, you know, at this point of concept review, I do appreciate um, that perspective you showed us of the rooftop deck, um, and and I do, you know, kind of like that at least in, in current concept. I think it's it looks nicely designed. I like the way the green space comes in, speaking to the mid-century sensibility of the um, design of the building so far. I think it's consistent with that, and actually also picks up some elements from some surrounding buildings, which is nice. And um, I, I would love to see. I appreciate. That you're going to need to work on maybe some screening or something for the neighbors um but it's nice to see a good rooftop deck concept thank you great anything else on uh key issue two then okay great all right i think well, john might have been unmuting john, and yeah. trying to talk oh go ahead john i'm sorry yeah thank you um I, I really have a bad connection tonight, so I'm <laughs> having trouble understanding everybody else's comments. My main uh, thought is that the, this is very blocky, and uh, it seems to me very clear that it's attempting to fit the map. needs to be some consideration given to the neighbor to the east and the impact on them of what's being proposed. And I think as, as Sarah six might be the way to approach that. So one, um, I, I guess we, uh, the planning board does have the uh, um, purview to uh, recommend uh, design advisory board look at this. Uh, uh, show of hands, uh, who would be interested in uh, sending a message that uh, this should be looked at. We dab. I see four hands and actually five hands with Lisa. <laughs> and so uh, it looks like we have a majority anyway. It doesn't have to be a formal vote. So let's uh, go ahead and go on record as uh, recommending that Dab take a look, look at this one. Uh, so key issue three then, uh, considering the proposed open space reduction uh, to 30% of the site, is the proposed open space appropriate in design character and usability for primary users on the site as required per the site review criteria? And I know there's been a lot of uh, comments on uh, on the courtyard, but we can continue to embroider on that. Sarah. Um, so I would say I agree completely with staff that the current proposal open space doesn't meet code requirements. And I actually wrote down what I wanted to say um, uh, per staff. Um, for multifamily and student housing, the open space should break up the density, mass, and scale of the development and be programmable for the needs of the residents. That's what staff wrote. And I would, I would follow that up with saying, currently, the open space proposed at 30% is actually driven by the density, mass, and scale of the building. Like, it's an afterthought rather than an integral part. It, that's how it reads to me, that it's an afterthought. And um, it needs to be, whether it's 30% or 60%, I think it needs to be much uh, better thought out, more accessible, more programmable, 
Um, I don't think the courtyard is going to meet the needs of the folks who are living in that building. It's basically going to be a space they pass through because uh, it's not going to get sun for most of the morning and most of the evening. And in the winter, it's going to be freezing. And uh, so I, I really feel like in some ways, even at 30% open space, it's the open space that's going to end up driving the design of this building. Okay, great. And John, did you have your hand up? Uh... I think uh, Sarah, Sarah got my thoughts very well, so I won't uh, embroider on that. All right. Great. Anyone else want to add any add, add on to the uh, open space reduction conversation? I'll, I'll just I'll just third what Sarah said because I, I thought it was uh, well well stated. And uh, absolutely, with staff having raised that issue, I uh, I will echo that the, the, there needs to be work done before site review on on the open space design and programming. Yeah. Peter, uh, Lisa, any, any last just thumbs up, ready to go? I agree with what's been said and what staff has said. Okay, wonderful. All right, well, those are the three key issues. Any other uh, comments before we kind of loop back and check in with Eric? All right, um, well, Eric, you probably, um, I think you've heard uh, a pretty good um, and a pretty, I think the board spoke uh, pretty much with one voice on a lot of issues tonight. Um, hopefully those will be helpful to you as you take this uh, project. It's going to, it looks like, a, like it's going to be a really good project uh, to add housing to this block. So uh, any, anything you wanted to respond before we finish up here? Um, no, I think, I mean, I, one thing I appreciate is um, sort of one voice is really good and I applaud you for that. <laughs> we've been through this with many voices and I like that at least we've got a direction instead of a lot of different things to chase. So so this is good and nothing you've brought up is really a surprise. Things that we've been looking at refining during the site review phase. Um, <laughs> I respectfully would push back a little bit on the design review board. Um, I love those guys, but it's just another step. Um, I Maybe a challenge, if I come back at site review and I haven't addressed your concerns, maybe you punish me with design review board. <laughs> but it's just, a we're really talking about a, um, this process has drug on quite a bit because we couldn't get an appointment with you um, because of the overload um, situation. And so for months we've been waiting in queue, you know, to, to have this meeting. I'm assuming that's gonna be the same for DAB. And then it's just, this process is really stretching out. I mean, I've been through some long processes, years, frankly, but um, this is a small project and I would, I would hope that um, maybe you could put some faith in me that I can come back um, and answer your concerns. That's my plea. Well, we could talk about that. Now, the one, one thing that, you know, I've been the liaison to DAB this year and they've had a number of canceled meetings. So I felt like they haven't had the overload that we've had. So um, that's one thing that made me think it would, might not be quite so impactful. Uh, but I don't know, what does the board feel like? I mean, I, you know, we could wait till site review and see if we think that the DAB needs to look at it. Um, if, if we're, if we want to be warm to that request. Well, but then it's, I mean, it, first of all, we don't, aren't the ones who decide, right? We recommend it and then council makes a decision. Is that correct, David? Um, I think we we have um, uh, and Hella, you can correct me if I'm wrong, if I'm wrong, but I think we have uh, the authority to um, recommend a DAB review. You have referral authority to DAB. Okay. Yeah. Well, and we've we've done it in the past. So, 
So I appreciate Eric's concerns, but if it comes back at site review, you will have already done all that work. And if we then say, sit, suggest that it, or recommend that it go to DAB, right, then you don't have their input. So, I mean, maybe there's a way, look, we're not in charge of the staffs of how things are scheduled, but maybe Charles can tell us if there's a way to move this project to mm -hmm. the front of the line at DAB so that yeah. whatever is the length of time that they've been working on it. Yeah, there's no there's no delay right now currently um, with scheduling items for design advisory board. I think um, Eric was referring to the fact that because of a shortage of staff due to COVID-19 budget reductions, um, we've had a bit of a queue on uh, getting development projects, you know, routed. So um, it's not uncommon right now for things that are coming into the office to have to wait a track or two before staff can actually get them routed. But um, as far as DAB goes, there's uh, there's no backup right now or any backlog. So we should be able to do that pretty expeditiously if that was the recommendation of the board. And like I say, I think about half of the meetings were canceled this year uh, <laughs> due to nothing on their work plan. So um, happy to do what you guys want, obviously. Shall we, shall we stick with our well, George is raising his hand. Yeah, I, I, I was just gonna. I was gonna say, I, I would be, I, I'd be very concerned that it would get back to us, and then we'd refer it to DAB, and it could actually be a much more circular process than just quickly going to DAB and getting their input. Um, so my, my my advice would be to stick to that plan. I think for the benefit of the applicant, truthfully, um, to make sure the process is as smooth as possible. I think that's a good point, and uh, and I think that um, when we do see things that have gone through DAB, uh, you know, we don't have any a lot of architectural experience on the board, so it's it's not you know we tend to uh, feel more comfortable knowing that DAB has had that uh, look at it in some cases. So that that so let's um, stick with that. But thank you. I, I hope it uh, sure. you, you can it it can be an easy night for you. It. Uh, like I say, it, it tends to be related to the size of the project, how long it takes. So um, I, I would think that they'll they'll have just a few key issues to to go through on that. Um, other anything else you want to? All right. Well, okay. Well, thank you very much. Uh, we'll be looking forward to. I won't be in the room when you come back, but uh, <laughs> I'm sure the rest of the folks here, besides me and Peter, will look forward to seeing you again. Cheers. Right. Thank you very much. I appreciate the input. All right. Have a good David, one. David, we'll try to we'll try to channel you and Peter. Okay. <laughs> we'll oh. focus on placemaking and transportation. We will channel you all. Please do. I always <laughs> think it's good to go back and relook at all my notes and everything at, uh, from the concept reviews. So, great. Pass them along. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Take Thanks, care. Thanks, guys. Yeah. Cheers. Bye bye. And well done, Chabnam, on your uh, presentation. Yeah, and thank I you, thought Eric. Me. I thought Eric did a great job too. So thank good you, tag team there. <laughs> yeah, great. All right. Well, let's go ahead then and uh, uh, transition then to matters. Um, let's see. In terms of uh, matters from planning board, um, I guess I was just going to bring up that uh, Cindy announced uh, East Boulder sub community walking tours. Uh, to uh, happen uh, in small groups before the uh, uh, March 31st meeting. So thank you, Cindy, for that. That's great. So if you haven't sent Cindy your availability, please do. Um, I don't know if there's any chance of another date getting at it, but <laughs> I'm going to probably have to run back from Aspen early, but we'll, we'll see how that goes. Yeah. Um, anything you wanted to add on that walking tours, Cindy? Or? Um, no, um, and actually that that whole setup and arrangement came from Holly Opansky, who okay. was part of that committee and everything. So I'm gonna give her the props on that. So I'm just the messenger. Right. <laughs> yeah, so Holly, I guess, is organizing all that. So should be good. Um, and then, uh, and we've been kind of wanting to do a walking tour, so that's exciting. Uh, and then uh, the other thing I wanted to bring up as a board matter is, and as, as Cindy, I guess this is uh, for you too, is we have talked about the uh, APA conference in San Diego, April 30th through May 3rd. 
Um, do you think we can go, because uh, we kind of have a backlog of people who have been on planning board for two or three years who have never been able to go. So um, it might be good if you could, uh, would, are you accepting people's names for that? And I am accepting, we can take two people. Um, I know that, I think the last time we did this was 2019 and I, think that Sarah and Lupita had just come on and they really wanted to go and I'm looks like I'm wrong. <laughs> no, no, I mean, that is when we came on, but as I said to David the other day, no, the invitation was never, ex nobody extended an invitation to, we didn't know, about, or I didn't know about it. Maybe Lupita did, but I did. Well, I know. think if, if my memory serves, somebody else hadn't gone yet. And so, and I, I don't recall who, but we kind of do it in order. And then the pandemic hit and nobody's gone since, but it's back open. So I'm gonna let the board decide who wants to go. We can allow two people and we pay for your, your travel and your hotel, your airfare. Um, and yeah, I think you get a stipend and all that stuff. And so it's a good trip. And I'm sure Peter and I can both uh, vouch for how useful it is. I learned an awful lot. So, uh, Sarah, you probably have first pick. Well, I, I'd love to go. I, um, okay. but I, you know, I'm just one of. There, there will be there will be three additional people coming on board. Um, you get first choice because you're. You you haven't been on. You have yet. first dibs, Sarah. Okay, I think I we would, need. I think would very much like to go. <laughs> I actually would like to go. <laughs> yeah, I think it, um, we should really give uh, the opportunity because actually for um, new members, it's nice to have a year maybe and then uh, then kind of start to fill in gaps. So yeah, Lisa and Georgie, I guess you're the other two that would want to- I would like to go either this year and I just need to dig into logistics. Um, and if I don't go this year, I definitely want to go next year to Philadelphia. Um, so. If someone else very much wants to go, I would appreciate maybe if I could have a couple of days just to work out logistics. And if someone's like, oh, okay. I have to go to San Diego, I'm dying, then like, you know, you, you can have my oh. phone go to Philadelphia. But and I'll I'll do all your travel. We'll get it all figured. Yeah, everything. <laughs> Amazing. <laughs> and uh, so I'm gonna let you and Georgie wrestle it out. My my schedule is pretty packed, so I'm I'm happy not to go. Um, okay. Yeah, so I, I've got a pretty packed stuff going on. Okay, well, um, I, in, uh, Lisa, sure. if you need a few days, um, why don't, uh, uh, you, you know, maybe Sarah, you could get registered and, uh, and start that. And then uh, if the two of you kind of both decide you want to wait, then uh, maybe one of the new members could jump on. So I'll take care of your registration too, because oh, great. that as well. So I just want to put everything on my card and it's just easier that way. So I'll take care. Um, do you want me to wait, Lisa, though, to register you for a little yeah, bit? Yeah, let's wait, and I'll talk to you offline. The question is, am I taking the baby, and am I taking someone else with me to manage the baby and logistics? But we can cover it. Let's Understood. just take the baby. We'll just take the baby and carry. Take the baby. Just take the baby everywhere. Yeah. Take the baby. The baby. We've got to start <laughs> on being a planner early. <laughs> I don't want to eat all the things right now. Will be his main goal. <laughs> Great. Okay. And um, I'll just also say, once you do get registered, um, go uh, see if there's any availability for some of the interesting tours, uh, especially the ones where you, uh, you can do things like get on the city bikes, or you can go on buses and go see things. Uh, those tend to fill up really early. Um, and don't, don't despair if they're not open, because uh, oftentimes you can just go as a, a waitlist person the day of, just go see if they can give you a spot, but but, get, but um, definitely check those out first. Um, a lot of the other, and some of the, some of the little, um, some of the specialized events have uh, limits on them too. So you can kind of check out the ones that you might want to sign up early for. And I just put it on my calendar to register you guys tomorrow. Um, and so I'll let you know when you're registered so you can go in and look at the classes and stuff, uh, or excuse me, seminars, because they do fill up fast. Great, thank you so much. Great. All right, and uh, I guess that's it uh, as far as I'm concerned for matters from the planning board. Anyone else have, have planning board matters? Well, I, have I have a matter. <laughs> okay, yeah, I was gonna ask uh, um, from attorneys. Hello. 
Yeah, I have a matter and it, it relates back to the co concept plan that you guys had recently. I think uh, it was the 30, 33 Penrose concept plan and proposed BHP uh, project. And there was a little bit of discussion. I think um, maybe Bill Holly could offer it a side tour and some of you um, expressed interest in that. And I just wanted to give you some legal considerations and, and wanted to kind of hear who all was interested in that and, and what the purpose of that is. And so one of the things to con consider is the concept plan is still subject to call up by city council. So it's still currently pending. And then after the concept plan, of course, it's likely that the project will come back to you as a quasi judicial item. So one thing to consider is that um, you should try to avoid any ex parte communications to avoid due process violations or appearances of impropriety. And I think it's really difficult to avoid those conversations during site tours, but it's not impossible. Um, and typically we don't do guided site tours and you guys check out the sites by yourself to avoid that kind of setup. So with all of that said, I, I got the impression when I was listening to you that you were just really interested to see the building that's there right now in light of its history. Um, and a site review hasn't been filed yet. So I was gonna advise you that if you do go on a tour, um, look at it as the sole purpose of it being seeing the physical layout. Do not talk about proposed development there. If you go with someone else, not with that person, whether it's the applicant, a member of the public, another planning board member, uh, don't, don't talk about development application. Um, and then be prepared to, just if there was any conversation, be prepared to make a thorough disclosure of what you may have learned. And then you could also think about scheduling it a bit or how the tour would work. Um, and I've, I haven't talked to staff about it, but one option might be to have a staff led tour. Um, and then you could, if you're just interested in that, in the layout, you could wait till after the site review, or if you wanna do it beforehand, um, I think it would be best to wait until the site review, the concept plan process is completed and before the site review application is filed. I think there's probably some lag time in, in between that. And then if, if it's three or more of you going together, then we'll have to make sure that you can meet the open meeting law requirements by posting it and making it available for the public to join as well. So I'll just, um, I saw Lisa nodding at the same time I was. My, my interest was to see the ge geological union building because uh, the applicants made it sound like a very interesting building. So I'm happy to wait until after site review to go, I mean, I'm happy to wait until it, it's deemed appropriate, but it, I'm not interested in having Bill Hollicky walk me through the plans for the for the uh, for the project. He already did that in concept concept review, so that's my thinking on it. Yeah, I I just kind of like to see it before, um, you know, it, it's it's modified or changed, but purely more from a, a appreciate appreciation and historical perspective as opposed to anything specific about the um, the site. So, you know, I I don't know that it has to be a staff member, but yeah, like I, I almost want someone like from the Geologic Society or something, like the original architect, like come out of retirement and like tell me maybe what their someone, concept was or something. Someone. I don't know, but I don't, I don't want to do anything that um, poisons the well or requires a whole lot of disclosure or gets into something that ought to be noticed. That's, I just want to see it. from Landmarks could take us. Yeah, Landmarks or something. Then they're okay. going to try Landmark it, don't I? No, I'm kidding. I don't think they need the landmark if they've already agreed. They already to. landmarked it. We're good. <laughs> I, I have a little bit of trauma around a certain building right now, but I'm <laughs> okay. Well, and yeah, it's funny because uh, I I thought I remembered that conversation kind of landing on that we would not be encouraged to do the uh, tour. So I um but um. The, Yes, I probably missed a few words that were said at the time. So thank you, Hella, for that. <laughs> um, so it sounds like there, that um, you, you, you've heard the the uh, guardrails, and uh, anyone who is interested should follow those guidelines. Anything else we need to talk about on that, Helen? Yeah, I think the 
I think the applicant team reached out and, and was kind of trying to get a feel okay. how many of you were interested. So it might be nice to get back to them as well. Or And if, if you're just fine with going afterward, after the site review, maybe we could. Was there an email sent? Well. Was there an email sent to the whole planning board? Okay. No, oh. I, I think they reached out to staff. Oh, okay. I, so I sent, sure. I got back from my month with in Washington. I emailed Ian Swallow and said, "Hey, I'm back, and I'd like to follow up on the discussion about getting a tour of the Geological Union building." And he said, "I'll check with Charles." And my guess is that this conversation is a result of Charles then checking with Hella. Okay, well, it sounds like Sarah and Lisa are interested. Are there any other people who are have a burning desire? John is interested. So that's three planning board members. Um, so do we want to then, um, uh, Helen, do we want to just uh, get back to them that we have three uh, members that are interested and then let, let that take place using your gui the guidelines you just out, laid out. Yeah, maybe you can, you all can tell us now, would you like to schedule it sooner rather than later? Or do you just want to wait till after the site review is done? I'm, I'm fine with waiting until after site review. Lisa, what about you? Yeah, I'd, I'd just like to see it before it's modified, but again, more from an yeah. artistic and historical perspective rather than in my formal capacity as a planning board member. So any yeah. time that meets that is great. I agree. Okay. So we're going to uh, defer that until after site review. Does that make sense? All right. That's Perfect. Thanks. All right. We'll keep a placeholder on that. Um, Somebody, I guess, uh, whoever's in uh, communication with Holicky and his folks can relay that message. Perfect. Okay. All right. Well, um, and then uh, matters from, uh, I think that, uh, uh, Charles had to drop off, but um, Cindy, did you have any additional matters? Mm -hmm. I have two things, just kind of some reminders. Um, so as far as changing our date, meeting date, we took our proposed Tuesdays to um, city manager's office and they accepted our proposal of the first, third, and sometimes the fourth Tuesdays um they accepted that and that will begin july 19th will be our first tuesday meeting and it'll be tuesdays from there on out i already know i won't be able to be there <laughs> oh i've got a work trip oh no well you know but this raises a question actually about i mean i, I mentioned this in a conversation with david earlier this week uh-huh well, uh, Hopefully I won't start traveling as much as I used to for work, but I could always make it back in time for a Thursday night meeting. Much harder to do that for a Tuesday night meeting. Um, so I'm wondering if there is some discussion about being able to join via Zoom occasionally with this new Tuesday night thing um, to accommodate the impact, the, trying to balance my job and the, and the planning board responsibilities. I, yeah, I, I kind of knew where you were going with that. So um, so here's what I know about us going back in person. So we're Zoom for now. So this it would be easy now. Um, what I know at this point is um, on the 15th, the council is going to be talking about going back in person. They've already discussed a little bit. I think they're going to try to go back to person in May. And, um, and then boards and commissions would follow after that. Um, we are trying to do hybrid, and I do mean trying. It's not, we haven't ironed out all the bugs yet. So, and what I, so I don't have a definite answer of what hybrid's going to look like, but in my mind's eye, hybrid would mean the board and staff are together and the public can be either there or hybrid. But I also think that that means that a board member could be, could link in as well, but I don't know yet. Okay. So that, please don't etch that in stone, but we are going to be hybrid because we can't go backwards. Right. So that's, the, that's the word I, I hear is it will be hybrid. Great, well, if you could, you know, 
when they're having these discussions, um, figure out, I, I get, I don't know what we have to decide as a group or the city decides if there's some small number of times that a, we could participate as board members on Zoom once we go live, once we go in person again, that mm -hmm. would alleviate the conflict that I can see coming down the pike. I would love, I'm with you. And that's one of the top things on my list is we, because it, it does happen, you know, and um, with Lisa having a small baby and stuff, it would be wonderful if she could, she may not be able to be here sometimes. And if she could link in with Zoom or any of you. And I think that's, that's the world we're in now is why not make it convenient for all of us? So this is a great tool. So that, that I'm, I'm with you. I'm on your side. So. <laughs> and I'll, I'll just echo what Sarah said and, and let us know if, um, you know, we'd have to see if other board members wanted to and, and new board members, but um, yeah, any kind of a written statement, because I think obviously I have my own personal bias around it right now, that ways in which it helps me. But I also think just from an equity perspective, like, you know, being able to invite people to serve as board members for them to know, oh, I can serve on the board and I have to block out that time, but it's okay if I'm in another city or you know, I have to block out that time. And most of the time I'm going to try to have childcare, but I don't have to pay for childcare every single time I do it. Or, you know, or someone who's physically disabled who recently had an organ transplant is like, I'm not comfortable sitting in chambers for five hours, you know, breathing recirculated air, but I'm happy to call in from home. Um, you know, so I think there's equity for the public, but also for staff um, and for board members and for staff, especially, I mean, just to be able to be at home and eat dinner and wait for your item. I mean, that's so much better. Not that I don't miss the dinners and the candy bowl, because I do. <laughs> no, well, I, I totally hear you. I'm, I agree with you guys a thousand percent. So and just to make sure, um, since this got brought up right after the July 19th was said, July 19th for now is still just a Zoom uh, uh, meeting for all we know. For, we for we don't have we any, we, we, that's not correlated with the return to life in any magical way. <laughs> No, no, that's just, uh, that's just, that's when, just a meeting right now when all the meeting dates are going to flip because yeah. the, the city council will start going to Thursdays right after their recess. So their first meeting after their recess and, and our first meeting after the council's recess would be, would have been July 21st, but now it's going to be July 19th. So. Yeah. And to Lynn's concern uh, that we don't know of any other boards that are scheduled for Tuesday nights at this point. No, I've double checked. Uh, there are no other meetings for Tuesday nights that I know of because council always had Tuesday nights. Yeah. So everyone stayed. I see, I see Lynn is still listening. So thought I would uh, make sure because I, I know that that's a concern. Okay, um, great. I have, one more thing. One? Mm -hmm. I have one more thing. Just to let you guys know, it, it has started. We've had applicants for planning board. They're interviewing. And we've had 10, at least 10 applicants. Their applications are on the website. Um, it's on the boards and commissions page. Planning boards, applicants start about three, at page 320. So you, there are no bookmarks. Unfortunately, you have to, I had to scroll all the way through to find where it started. So three, page 320. And they've started um, their interviews. And um, David and Peter have two more meetings with us and then we get new people. So it is happening. Three new people. Yeah. Three so, people. Yeah. And Sounds the, the um, actual uh, nomination and voting process is Tuesday or is that? Uh, the, on 315, um, it's 315, March 15th, um, the board will announce the appointments. Okay. So, and that's all I've got. Thanks, Cindy. Thank you. Any any other matters uh, from anyone else? All right. Thanks so much. Uh, not too late. And uh, good job, everyone. Uh, Thanks, we'll see Cindy. you in two weeks for a uh, use table standards uh, update. Ha ha ha! Exciting. All right. Thank Cheers. you. Night, everyone. Bye. Good night, everyone.